Yeah, the reports of the the reports of the 2019 Vulcan survey had like 40 plus feet buried in sediment. 2019 Vulcan survey had like 40 plus feet buried in sediments. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, we can see that a large section of debris uh, on the other side of the wreck, and then this this is the main part. Yeah, and we see lines of portholes, uh, two lines in the midships, and then a single line above the casemate guns further aft. But there's a lot above those in the diagrams anyway that we're not looking at here on the wreck site, yeah. that's for sure. It's kind of amazing that they, they needed to scuttle this um, with, with the amount of damage. Uh, I think only two torpedoes were used to sink it as opposed to the four uh, for Akagi. And they, they both came from one destroyer, which was the Hagikaze. Ed, would you push on that cable? Yeah, you uh, got it. I wonder it. if that yep. was one of the arrestor cables. Without scouting lasers, all we have is, uh, I'm sorry, I just don't have control of this lens. Would you like a camera cycle, power cycle? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, just bear with me for a second while I see if I can exercise it, warm it up a little bit. We don't have a bottle temp on a mini Zeus, do we? Uh, Bottle temp? Uh, we do. Oh, well, on on the main bottle. But yeah. Not yeah. mini zoos itself. Right, let me try it again. And let it go. And that stopped. Let it go. Yeah, maybe we're okay. Now that's attached. I think. Oh, we're we'll gonna have to get closer. Oh, run away. Run away. Super hard to tell. Yeah, and I'm going to bring the sonar scale back to 10. Yeah, sounds good. That All also right. looked like a second line of portholes. So one above the yeah. other, I... rather than in here. Maybe okay. we're in here. Yeah, wow. Just a guess. Yeah. Our whole Lutherian's back. Yeah. Same one. I have learned it to followed those. us 18 miles. Are there casement guns on this one? Uh, yeah. There are. There are. Ten of them. Yeah, that's what it looks like. I was just making sure that was interpreting that correctly. Very low. Yeah. So again, a converted um, hull. Battleship hull, was it, Mike? I believe it was a cruiser. Cruiser hull. They could be right Oops. down at the mud line if we see them. Yeah. I might be seeing a ladder through that hole to the left of that portal. Do you see that? Maybe not. Could be in ribs framing. Oh, actually, um, Kaga was, was initially begun as a battleship. So it was slower than a Kagi. A little shorter, a little slower. Got some nice rusticles there. 
Mike, you seen that ladder-like thing inside that opening? Yeah. Some kind of structure. Mike, are rusticles what we see kind of hanging down? Yeah, so um, that's a term coined by Dr. Ballard when he was uh, on Titanic in uh, 86, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. he, he said, just he, he described them as rust icicles, basically, and the, the term stuck. It's now considered a scientific term. Um, and yeah, it's, it's caused by bacteria that are um, consuming the steel. Mm. And, and the, uh, the bacteria is named after Titanic too. I forget, it's like, I forget exactly what it, what it is, but Titanic is in the, is in the name. Wow. Though I do think they've discovered a couple of different species of bacteria that, that do it. Coming out. Mm -hmm. Nice. Good visibility. Yeah, I think it's better than the other two sites. Full wide. At least until we start we, poking we around. Pump up the bottom. That's excellent visibility. That's almost like the this portion of the wreck lies in a trench where the, the mud was pushed up perhaps by the impact. Yeah, it's a trench made by itself. And then the, the wreck falls away a little bit and opens a trench between the hull and the, the slope there. That could be a figment of our perspective here, but... Do you know what the identifying characteristic of this is as versus the Soryu? Uh, well, the length is a big one because um, it's about 100 feet longer. Um, the casemate guns, the size and plate, or just the size because the placement's similar, but the size of the, uh, the, the venting stack, uh, which will be on the other side, and uh, the name at the, back, at the stern. <laughs> Yeah, we were surprised to see the name, pleasantly surprised to see the Akagi at the stern. Was it a welding bead as well as the, that had been painted over, I think? It looked like that, yeah, some sort of raised um, metal that, that then was yeah. painted over. When you see those things in the plan drawings, you never know if they've actually done what the plan has, but we hope to see that at the, at, at the aft end here. So just... Let me know if you get if you want to ship movement. Yeah, let's. Um, th this is starting to look good. You can, you know, the lights are starting to show us a little bit of the color, which so it means we're like a, a good lighting distance. Um, but we don't want to get too far over the wreck. So if we can figure out the strike, um, which I think. So my thought was about 75 degrees, uh, 75 heading from here. I'm gonna try and square it up as best I can. Yeah, please. And I thought about zero. Let's see. That looks about right. 15. I want to say a couple to the right. Yeah. Well, if that looks about as straight on as I could get, and that's zero two zero. So one one zero would be a. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, hey, hey, my my yeah. side. Yep. Are, are you thinking going? Are you thinking of going aft and exploring? You know, along port side. It's indeed just where we are. Um, to to image that uh, the destruction line with um what do you think in as far as direction yeah we're gonna we're gonna start moving um aft to the stern and then come up around the other side okay so okay. i'm hearing how, how big a move would you like uh let's start with 20 meters 20 meters bearing 110 yeah sorry phil what was that 20 meters bearing 110 110 degrees. Phil, does that work for you guys? 
So moving aft towards the steering. Yeah, we'll get some Luckily, we'll have, we'll have plenty of time to get the great lead. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we just, I want to see if we see any changes in the, um, see if there's any more of this elevated than where we are, because um, this is surprisingly buried and the top is quite significantly missing. <laughs> Um, and then we have plenty to, to look at. There's there's another piece of wreckage off site, uh, off the uh, starboard s side. So we have plenty to look at now. And uh, yeah, we, we are we're on the port side based on the sonar we have from 2019, um, which clearly shows the bow and the uh, the other wreckage on the off the other side. So we'll be moving to our right, which is to the stern. Bridge nav. Like to do a ship move, please. Two zero meters, bearing one one zero. Thank you. Mike, do you have a feel for that uh, circular part that comes away from the main part at a ninety degree angle? Two portholes to our starboard. Oh, let me come over. Um, I'm sorry. What? What's the question? This object here that appears to come out ninety degrees from the. I think it's just a port. Tie off, oh, oh, oh. Uh, looks like a tie of some sort. Yeah. That might have been what that cable we saw earlier was. Hooked yeah, to. could be an anchor point for for cable or yeah. Just to the I left. I thought and that was a porthole. You can first. see the cable starts or it looks yeah. like it's attached to the deck there. Yeah. Um. Since we're here, Tito, can we get a zoom? Oh, I forgot uh, we can draw on the screen. That object? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and which one would you like to look at? The one on top? Yeah, got it. Uh, just bringing the camera up oh, That's here. my new favorite feature, this as, control. As we're here. Uh, I can't really make out what that yeah. is. Do a, are you okay with the tighter zoom here, just on the yes. metal? And once again, Ed, please take advantage of all the zoom you'd like. I'm flying by altimeter and yeah. sonar mostly. Copy, thank you. Oh, that's helpful. Not sure what that is. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I made reference to something a minute ago that I'll explain to the to our viewers. Um, Hans just circled something on the on the screen for the pilots to see. So we're in a new control van relative well, for me at least. It's been a few years, but for me it's a new control van from the one that we used to have. And um, and one of one of the fun features is we have a screen back here in the science row where we can put arrows and draw circles and stuff to to tell the pilots uh, what we want to zoom in on better and video better than just saying, no, no, over there, over there, over there, over there. Uh, so we're able to circle, which is a, I think it might be my new favorite feature, um, to tell them exactly what sort of uh, sponges or corals we're looking at when we're on the sea mounts, and uh, it just helps with communication. Uh, this is Tito on the front row. I love that. Uh, yeah. You know, having done so many dives and so much time piloting, really wish we had that. Were we just, just yelling at you? Instead of scientists with a <laughs> stick pointing at the screen. Yeah. And actually, I forgot about it until Hans circled it. I was like, oh, yeah, we can do that. We actually still have the stick of pointing here. I bet you, you do. Want to go old? <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. Stick it's always a good pointing. backup. But that uh, device is a telestrator. You frequently see it used on uh, sporting broadcasts. Yeah, it's great. We have Mia to thank for that. Just a shout out to the 0 to 4 a.m. watch. So... Um, yeah, thank you, John. He's pointing out that it's looking like it's the bulge at the water line, and we're very low down. And looking at the diagram, one of the reference diagrams we have in cross section. Oh yeah. Um, significant part of the upper superstructure is gone. Whereas yesterday we're looking at the Akagi's flight deck, albeit you know a massively damaged and 
mostly missing flight deck, at least that level was there. Here, we simply are not seeing that upper level at all. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, we can see that a large section of debris uh, on the other side of the wreck, and then this, this is the main part. Yeah, and we see lines of portholes, uh, two lines in the midships, and then a single line above the casemate guns further aft. But there's a lot above those in the diagrams anyway that we're not looking at here on the wreck site, yeah. that's for sure. kind of amazing that they, they needed to scuttle this um, with, with the amount of damage. Uh, I think only two torpedoes were used to sink it as opposed to the four uh, for Akagi. And they, they both came from one destroyer, which was the Hagikaze. And Ed, would you push on that cable? Yeah, you uh, got it. I wonder it. if that yep. was one of the arrestor cables. Without scouting lasers, all we have is, uh, I'm sorry, I just don't have control of this lens. Would you like a camera cycle, power cycle? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, just bear with me for a second while I see if I can exercise it, warm it up a little bit. We don't have a bottle temp on a mini Zeus, do we? Uh, bottle temp? Uh, we do. Oh, well, on on the main bottle, but yeah. not yeah. mini zoos itself. Right, let me try it again and let it go. And that stopped. Let it go. Yeah, maybe we're okay. Now that's attached. I think uh, we're got to get closer. Oh, run away. Run away. Boy, That's super hard to tell. And I'm going to bring the sonar scale back to 10. Yeah, sounds good. That All also right. looked like a second line of portholes. So one above the yeah. other, Aye. rather than in here, maybe okay. we're in here. Yeah, wow. Just a guess. Yeah. Our whole Lutherian's back. Yeah. Same one. I've learned it spot followed this. us 18 miles. Are there casement guns on this one? Uh, yeah. There are. There are. Ten of them. Yeah, that's what it looks like. I was just making sure that was interpreting that correctly. Very low. Yeah. So again, a converted um, hull. Battleship hull, was it, Mike? I believe it was a cruiser. Cruiser hull. They could be right Oops. down at the mud line if we see them. Yeah. I might be seeing a ladder through that hole to the left of that portal. Do you see that? Maybe not. Could be in ribs framing. Oh actually um Kaga was was initially begun as a battleship. So it was slower than a Kagi. A little shorter, a little slower. Got some nice rusticles there. 
Mike, are you seeing that ladder-like thing inside that opening? Yeah. Some kind of structure. Mike, are rusticles what we see kind of hanging down? Yeah, so um, that's a term coined by Dr. Ballard when he was uh, on Titanic in uh, 86, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. he, he said just he he described them as rust icicles basically and the the term stuck it's now considered a scientific term um and yeah it's, it's caused by bacteria that are um consuming the steel mm. and, and the uh the bacteria is named after titanic too i forget it's like i forget exactly what it what it is but titanic is in the is in the name wow Though I do think they've discovered a couple of different species of bacteria that, that do it. Coming out. Mm -hmm. oh, nice. Good visibility. Yeah, I think it's better than the other two sites. Full wide. At least until we start we poking we around. Pump up the bottom. That's excellent visibility. It's almost like the this portion of the wreck lies in a trench where the, the mud was pushed up perhaps by the impact. Yeah, it's a trench made by itself. And then uh, the wreck falls away a little bit. It opens a trench between the hull and the, the slope there. It could be a figment of our perspective here, but... Do you know what the identifying characteristic of this is as versus the Soryu? Uh, well, the length is a big one because um, it's about 100 feet longer. Um, the casemate guns, the size and plate, or just the size because the placement's similar, but the size of the, uh, the, the venting stack, uh, which will be on the other side, and uh, the name at the, back, at the stern. <laughs> Yeah, we were surprised to see the name, pleasantly surprised to see the Akagi at the stern. Was it a welding bead as well as the, that had been painted over, I think? It looked like that, yeah, it was some sort of raised um, metal that, that then yeah. was painted over. When you see those things in the plan drawings, you never know if they've actually done what the plan has, but we hope to see that at the, at, at the aft end here. So just... Let me know if you get if you want to ship movement. Yeah, let's. Um, th this is starting to look good. You can, you know, the lights are starting to show us a little bit of the color, which so it means we're like a, a good lighting distance. Um, but we don't want to get too far over the wreck. So if we can figure out the strike, um, which I think. So my thought was about 75 degrees, uh, 75 heading from here. I'm gonna try and square it up as best I yeah, can. Yeah, please. And I thought about zero. Let's see. That looks about right. 15. I'm going to say a couple to the right. Yeah. Well, that looks about as straight on as I could get, and that's zero two zero. So one one zero would be a. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, hey, hey, my my yeah. side. Yep. Are, are you thinking going? Are you thinking of going aft and exploring? You know, along port side. It's indeed this where we are. Um, to to image that uh, the destruction line with them, um, what are you thinking as far as direction? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start moving um, aft to the stern and then come up around the other side. Okay, so okay. I'm hearing. How how big a move would you like? Uh, let's start with 20 meters. 20 meters bearing one one zero. Yeah. Sorry, Phil. What was that? 20 meters bearing one one zero. 110 degrees. Phil, does that work for you guys? 
So moving aft towards the steering. Yeah, we'll have plenty of time to get the great lead. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we just, I want to see if we see any changes in the, um, see if there's any more of this elevated than where we are, because um, this is surprisingly buried and the top is quite significantly missing. <laughs> Um, and then we have plenty to, to look at. There's there's another piece of wreckage off site, uh, off the uh, starboard side. So we have plenty to look at now. And uh, yeah, we, we are we're on the port side based on the sonar we have from 2019, um, which clearly shows the bow and the uh, the other wreckage on the off the other side. So we'll be moving to our right, which is to the stern. Bridge nav. Like to do a ship move, please. Two zero meters, bearing one one zero. Thank you. Mike, do you have a feel for that uh, circular part that comes away from the main part at a ninety degree angle? Two portholes to our starboard. Oh, let me come over. Um, I'm sorry. What? What's the question? This object here that appears to come out ninety degrees from the. I think it's just a port. Tie off. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, looks like a tie of some sort. Yeah. That might have been what that cable we saw earlier was. Hooked yeah, to. could be an anchor point for for cable or yeah. Just to the I left. I thought that was a bit. porthole. You can first. see the cable starts or it looks yeah. like it's attached to the deck there. Yeah. Um. Since we're here, Tito, can we get a zoom? Oh, I forgot we can draw on the screen. That object? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and which one would you like to look at? The one on top? Yeah, got it. Okay, just bringing the camera up. Oh, that's here. my new favorite feature, this as, control. As we're here. Uh, I can't really make out what that yeah. is. Do a, are you okay with the tighter zoom here, just on the yes. metal? And once again, Ed, please take advantage of all the zoom you'd like. I'm flying by altimeter and yeah. sonar mostly. Copy, thank you. Oh, that's helpful. Not sure what that is. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I made reference to something a minute ago that I'll explain to the to our viewers. Um, Hans just circled something on the on the screen for the pilots to see. So we're in a new control van relative well, for me at least. It's been a few years, but for me it's a new control van from the one that we used to have. And um, and one of one of the fun features is we have a screen back here in the science row where we can put arrows and draw circles and stuff to to tell the pilots uh, what we want to zoom in on better and video better than just saying, no, no, over there, over there, over there, over there. Uh, so we're able to circle, which is a, I think it might be my new favorite feature, um, to tell them exactly what sort of uh, sponges or corals we're looking at when we're on the sea mounts, and uh, it just helps with communication. Uh, this is Tito in the front row. I love that. Uh, yeah. You know, having done so many dives and so much time piloting, really wish we had that. Were we just, just yelling at you? Scientists with a <laughs> stick pointing at the screen. Yeah. And actually, I forgot about it until Hans circled it. I was like, oh, yeah, we can do that. We actually still have the stick of pointing here. I bet you do. Want to go old? We do. Yeah. It's always a good backup. But that uh, device is a telestrator. You frequently see it used on uh, sporting broadcasts. Yeah, it's great. We have Mia to thank for that. Just to shout out to the 0 to 4 a.m. watch. So, um... Yeah, thank you, John. He's pointing out that it's looking like it's the bulge at the water line, and we're very low down. And looking at the diagram, one of the reference diagrams we have in cross section. Oh yeah. Um, significant part of the upper superstructure is gone. Whereas yesterday we're looking at the Akagi's flight deck, albeit you know a massively damaged and 
mostly missing flight deck, at least that level was there. Here, we simply are not seeing that upper level at all. Can we zoom in the interior uh, since we're here? Yeah, that's what Ed was talking about a minute ago. He said... I don't like, think that's a ladder. I it's think not it's a ladder. Uh, it's just a frame of something else. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's an anemone. It was actually on the hull. It probably thinks it's special. It does. And what about this line that's running horizontally from left to right with a brake right at this point? Is that a degaussing line? It could be one of my favorite features of the gaussing wire. <laughs> one of the new things that I learned about just the other day. All right, coming out. I've seen some degaussing wires in my time, Mike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Just uh, for for Derek and the pilots, just FYI, this is kind of like the perfect uh, distance off the wreck. Uh, we're able to light it well enough, uh, but also not be over the site. So I know that moving sh our ship moves are difficult once we get get going, but uh, this is this is kind of the sweet spot that we want to try to be at. Understood. Yeah, we'll try to stay that distance if we can. Yeah, and. Um, Gosh, I don't even see any marine snow coming down, but uh, I know that uh, it's, it felt like we had a little bit of current on site on the last dive, so hopefully we're not getting pushed around too much on this one. Like, the visibility is so, so good, I don't even have anything to look at to see what the current's doing. A lot of times those degaussing wires are in, in parallel, two or three, around the whole ship. I've, this is single, but maybe that is what it is. It's also underneath the portholes, which isn't really where that would, would have been. Yeah it's, yeah, it's generally pretty low down, but... Yeah, we're probably at the lowest level anyway. That's nice and clear. Yeah. I'm going to say we're right around five meters away. Yeah, that's a good spot. Uh, Mike or Hans, can y'all remind us of what kind of damage um, Kaga took on? Like, I know that it was scuttled um, with torpedoes, I'm assuming, but were there bombs and, like, fires, like what we were talking about with Akagi? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's in the confusion of battle. It's it's hard for uh, pilots to you know always confirm whether they have a, a hit or a near miss. But mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, when putting together all those reports and and firsthand evidence, we're looking at you know a number of bombs that struck the flight deck. Nakaga was hit early. And there are maybe four or five hundred bombs uh, that struck the deck and a 1,000 pound bomb as well. So multiple direct hits on the flight deck, igniting the fires, damaging the fire suppression system, um, wreaking havoc, wow. really uh, terrible fires. I think the majority of people who were lost were trapped down in the lower decks by the fires above them mm. in the hangar decks, and that's that's a terrible fate. Russ, we might, or Hans, we might be here. You remember how the deck kind of slopes off? But John was saying that we might be under the, uh, under the, 27 millimeter gun mounts.
Yeah, thank you, John. The, the, um, we're still getting oriented and seeking to confirm our location along the ship. It might be more forward than I was initially imagining. But it wasn't just the, the ordnance that went off and the bomb strikes themselves. The, the fuel lines were ruptured and the fuel air mixture in the hangars ignited. And I think the narrative records that the sides of the hangars were literally blown out. So whereas we still looked at the sides of the hangars on the Akagi, you know, right through the damaged flight deck, this, these sides were, were blown out, and maybe that's why we're really not seeing much of the upper structure at all. Yeah, I, th I think more than just the sides of the hangar deck were blown out. I think oh, yeah. many decks below yeah. as well. Yeah, so we're roughly halfway through that 20 meter move, so we've moved about 10 meters um, aft. Yeah the, the yeah, the vehicle is going to take a minute to follow because we haven't moved at all. Well, something I'm noticing, I may have been off a bit because we seem to be coming in on it a little bit. I'd yeah. like to go uh, maybe another 10 degrees. So what was the last one, 120? Uh, that was 110. Let's go 120. Yeah, I agree, Tito. That's a good call. We're starting to come a little over the wreck. All right. Yeah. Do you want to do I'm another my sonar closing up. 20 meters? That would be perfect. All right, put that move in now. Bridge, nav. I'd like to do a move two zero meters, bearing one two zero. Thank you. So we're getting some input from our, um, our colleagues on shore, trying to figure out where we are. If we are where we're suggesting we might we might be able to still see the casemate guns like we saw on Akagi, and they they might come up pretty soon as we head aft, or maybe just the tops of them. We'll yeah. see. Hans, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the perspective that you're bringing us as we are um, viewing this site. Um, earlier you mentioned that it was said before that a lot of the Japanese servicemen who were aboard the Kaga uh, were really young, like in their 20s. And I just appreciate you just kind of reminding us um, about the people that were involved in this place. And I think that's just kind of what's heavy on my mind right now as we're here. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I think the older I get, the more I appreciate the, the, the youth of <laughs> the next generation. Mm -hmm. my, my daughter's 30. So she would already have, are, is already older than many of the people who were lost here. Wow.
also just a moment to mention uh, for for folks that are our regular followers of our our ROV dives. Um, Come in. We are not diving with vehicle Hercules today. We're diving with our um, vehicle Atalanta. Uh, so it's a single body system we're using today, and uh, that's due to the the depth that we're at. We're at 5,430 meters right now, and that's beyond the depth that Hercules is rated for. Um, so if you see more motion than you're used to seeing in the video, the reason is we're on a single body that's attached to the ship with a cable, and some of the heave that the ship experiences at the surface is translated down that cable, which is why our, our oh, camera is moving up and down. Um, if you've been following us for the past, the previous two dives, um, you will have already you will already know this, but if anyone is new to this, uh, tuning in just for today, um, that is what the motion is that you're seeing there. Thanks, Dirt. And as much as oh, I would yeah. love to be here with a uh, RV like Hercules or Little Herc, I'm quite surprised uh, at the quality of the images we're able to get from Atalanta. Uh, I, I was, yeah, I'm very pleasantly surprised at um, the level of, of uh, imagery we've been able to get on these sites. Uh, there's no shortage of effort required over here to keep this in focus as we bounce up and down. Mm. Has Atalanta ever been used before as a single body system like this on dives? We did a dive, one dive with Atalanta. Might have been this year, I think it was last year, uh, before the season, just to spin out the cable and test it, I believe. It could have been different. Actually, it might have been way back, like 2019, uh, if that answers your question. Yeah, and was that to like test the cable specifically or um, test Atalanta's? We try and get the cable deep at the start of the season to spin mm -hmm. out any turns it would have in it, like it would accumulate with a garden hose. Mm -hmm. And I think Atalanta was maybe new to us at that point, so we wanted to do a deeper dive with it. Can we rotate to the left, Tito? Yep, coming over. Pull oh, Yeah, and, and uh, often, oftentimes uh, when Hercules is diving, it's diving with Argus as its companion vehicle and this this field season we've been using wow. Atalanta. Yeah, Sebastian just pointed out something to me that uh, on the diagram of the bomb hits and if we are where we think we are, aft of midships, aft of the tower, but still forward of the casemate guns, we're in the general area of a strike on the flight deck. Of course, that flight deck is gone. All of that above structure is gone. But that strike was on the port side in our general area of the 1,000-pound bomb dropped by George Goldsmith from VB-6. And so I'm just wondering, it could be that we're looking at the results of that in that deep pit. Shoreside, do you think we're, we're looking at perhaps some of that? Absolutely. You know, tracking some of the battle damage and, you know, looking at where Goldsmith hit was. I mean, it was the only one, at least from drawings that we're looking at, that was clearly on fourth side. So, you know, with most of the damage from two, potentially three major hits, albeit 500-pound bombs, but still, those were all situated around the island. So seeing this kind of damage from from fourth side just after midship, yeah, it's certainly certainly it could be related to that hit, which was um, the last uh, strike. Off to Taga. starboard still, there's, uh, I don't know how to describe it, like some, a part that has fallen off to the side, you can still see where it's attached. Uh, that help you visualize that a little better? Can we zoom in the interior, uh, since we're here? 
Yeah, that's what Ed was talking about a minute ago. He said, I don't like, think that's a ladder. I it's think not a it's ladder. A just frame of okay. something else. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, there's an anemone. It was actually on the hull. It probably thinks it's special. It does. And what about this line that's running horizontally from left to right with a break right at this point? Is that a degaussing line? It could be one of my favorite features of the gaussing wire. <laughs> one of the new things that I learned about just the other day. All right, coming out. I've seen some degaussing wires in my time, Mike. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Just uh, for for Derek and the pilots, just FYI, this is kind of like the perfect uh, distance off the wreck. Uh, we're able to light it well enough, uh, but also not be over the site. So I know that moving our ship moves are difficult once we get get going, but uh, this is this is kind of the sweet spot that we want to try to be at. Understood. Yeah, we'll try to stay that distance if we can. Yeah, and um, oh gosh, I don't even see any marine snow coming down, but uh, I know that uh, it's, it felt like we had a little bit of current on site on the last dive, so hopefully we're not getting pushed around too much on this one. Like, the visibility is so, so good, I don't even have anything to look at to see what the current's doing. A lot of times those degaussing wires are in, in parallel, two or three, around the whole ship. I've, this is single, but maybe that is what it is. It's also underneath the portholes, which isn't really where that would, would have been. Yeah it's, yeah, it's generally pretty low down, but... Yeah, we're probably at the lowest level anyway. That's nice and clear. Yeah. I'm going to say we're right around five meters away. Yeah, that's a good spot. Uh, Mike or Hans, can y'all remind us of what kind of damage um, Kaga took on? Like, I know that it was scuttled um, with torpedoes, I'm assuming, but were there bombs and like fires like what we were talking about with Akagi? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's in the confusion of battle, it's, it's hard for uh, pilots to, you know, always confirm whether they have a, a hit or a near miss, but mm -hmm. uh, ultimately when putting together all those reports and, and first-hand evidence, we're looking at, you know, a number of bombs that struck the flight deck. The Kaga was hit early, and there are maybe four or five hundred bombs um, that struck the deck, and a 1,000-pound bomb as well. So multiple direct hits on the flight deck, igniting the fires, damaging the fire suppression system, um, wreaking havoc, wow. really, uh, terrible fires. I think the majority of people who were lost were trapped down in the lower decks by the fires above them mm. in the hangar decks, and that's, that's a terrible fate. Russ, we might, or Hans, we might be here. You remember how the deck kind of slopes off? But John was saying that we might be under the, uh, under the, 27 millimeter gun mounts. Yeah, thank you, John. The, the, um, we're still getting oriented and seeking to confirm our location along the ship. It might be more forward than I was initially imagining, but it wasn't just the the 
ordnance that went off and the bomb strikes themselves, the, the fuel lines were ruptured and the fuel air mixture in the hangars ignited. And I think the narrative records that the sides of the hangars were literally blown out. So whereas we still looked at the sides of the hangars on the Akagi, you know, right through the damaged flight deck, this, these sides were, were blown out, and maybe that's why we're really not seeing much of the upper structure at all. Yeah, you know, I, th I think more than just the sides of the hangar deck were blown out. I think oh, yeah. many decks below yeah. as well. Yeah, so we're roughly halfway through that 20 meter move, so we've moved about 10 meters um, aft. Yeah the, the ve side. yeah, the vehicle's going to take a minute to follow because we haven't moved at all. Well, something I'm noticing, I may have been off a bit because we seem to be coming in on it a little bit. I'd yeah. like to go uh, maybe another 10 degrees. So what was the last one, 120? Uh, that was 110. Let's go 120. Yeah, I agree, Tito. That's a good call. We're starting to come a little over the wreck. All right. Yeah. You want to do I'm another my sonar closing up. 20 meters? That would be perfect. All right, put that move in now. Bridge, nav. I'd like to do a move two zero meters, bearing one two zero. Thank you. So we're getting some input from our, um, our colleagues on shore, trying to figure out where we are. If we are where we're suggesting we might we might be able to still see the casemate guns like we saw on Akagi, and they they might come up pretty soon as we head aft. Or maybe just the tops of them. We'll yeah. see. Hans, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the perspective that you're bringing us as we are um, viewing this site. Um, earlier you mentioned that it was said before that a lot of the Japanese servicemen who were aboard the Kaga uh, were really young, like in their 20s. And I just appreciate you just kind of reminding us um, about the people that were involved in this place. And I think that's just kind of what's heavy on my mind right now as we're here. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I think the older I get, the more I appreciate the, the, the youth of <laughs> the next generation. Mm -hmm. my, my daughter's 30. So she would already have, is already older than many of the people who were lost here. Wow.
also just a moment to mention uh, for for folks that are our regular followers of our our ROV dives. Um, oh, we are not diving with vehicle Hercules today. We're diving with our um, vehicle Atalanta. Uh, so it's a single body system we're using today, and uh, that's due to the the depth that we're at. We're at 5,430 meters right now, and that's beyond the depth that Hercules is rated for. Um, so if you see more motion than you're used to seeing in the video, the reason is we're on a single body that's attached to the ship with a cable, and some of the heave that the ship experiences at the surface is translated down that cable, which is why our, our oh, camera is moving up and down. Um, if you've been following us for the past, the previous two dives, um, you will have already you will already know this, but if anyone is new to this, uh, tuning in just for today, um, that is what the motion is that you're seeing there. Thanks, Terry. And as much as oh, I would yeah. love to be here with a uh, RV like Hercules or Little Herc. I'm quite surprised uh, at the quality of the images we're able to get from Atalanta. Uh, I, I was, yeah, I'm very pleasantly surprised at um, the level of, of uh, imagery we've been able to get on these sites. Uh, there's no shortage of effort required over here to keep this in focus as we bounce up and down. Has Atalanta ever been used before as a single body system like this on dives? We did a dive, one dive with that Atlanta. Might have been this year at Shake. I think it was last year at Sh uh, before the season just to spin out the cable and test it, I believe. It could have been different. And actually, it might have been way back, like 2019, uh, if that answers your question. Yeah, and was that to like test the cable specifically um, or test Atalanta's? We try and get the cable deep at the start of the season to spin mm -hmm. out any turns it would have in it, like you would accumulate with a garden hose. Mm -hmm. And I think Atalanta was maybe new to us at that point, so we wanted to do a deeper dive with it. Can we rotate to the left, Tito? Yep, coming over. Pull white. Yeah, and, and uh, often, oftentimes uh, when Hercules is diving, it's diving with Argus as its companion vehicle and this this field season we've been using wow. Atalanta. Yeah, Sebastian just pointed out something to me that uh, on the diagram of the bomb hits and if we are where we think we are aft of midships, aft of the tower but still forward of the casemate guns, we're in the general area of a strike on the flight deck. Of course that flight deck is gone all of that above structure is gone. But that strike was on the port side in our general area of the 1,000-pound bomb dropped by George Goldsmith from VB6. And so I'm just wondering, it could be that we're looking at the results of that in that deep pit. Shoreside, do you think we're, we're looking at perhaps some of that? Absolutely. You know, tracking some of the battle damage and, you know, looking at where Goldsmith's kit was. I mean, it was the only one, at least from drawings that we're looking at, that was clearly on fourth side. So, you know, with most of the damage from two, potentially three major hits, albeit 500-pound bombs, but still, those were all situated around the island. So seeing this kind of damage from, from fourth side just after midship, yeah, it's certainly... Certainly, it could be related to that hit, which was um, There's the last uh, strike. Off on to Taga. starboard, still. There's uh, I don't know how to describe it. Like some a part that has fallen off to the side. You can still see where it's attached. Uh, that help mm -hmm. you visualize that a little better.
Oh, it's um, Jeff Morris That's from Azamar Research pointing out that you can you can just about see some of this damage that's been falling off um, in that 2019 side scan sonar image that was generated by Vulcan Incorporated uh, in partnership with uh, Navy History and Heritage Command. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff and I go back a bit. We were at East Carolina University together. Hawaii. Derek, is it possible we could put in a, like a move directly off site just to kind of get us back? Uh, yeah, backing uh, like, the vehicle away from the wreck. Yeah, like five meters backwards. Sure. What, what was your heading when you were just spot directly facing the wreck? Zero two five. So two oh five. Thank you. Yeah, do you think five meters backing off will be enough? Yeah. Bridge, nav. We'd like to do a ship move five meters, bearing two zero five. Thank you. Yeah, once we do that, we can, um, we can continue moving, uh, was it one two zero? Hey Nautilus, um, ECC here. Uh, just checking in to see if we can't uh, confirm comms with my co-lead scientist ashore, Dr. James Delgado. Jim, can you hear us okay and, uh, and get on the line? So, Phil, presumably he's right. calling in? Jim's calling in uh, just for a bit, so we're configuring okay. some of that stuff, but he's, uh, he's following and tracking, and we got him over cell as well. Thank you again, John Parshall Ashore. We're reading your notes online, and uh, you're right, this is pretty low down, so it might be hard to say if the bomb hit did this or subsequent explosions continued the damage further down to these lower decks. We're so low that we're, we might be looking at the engineering spaces at the very bottom of the ship. Hey, Nautilus, do you see some of the curvature there on that, on that combing just in the center of view? I mean, yeah. I mean, is that, is that possible? It could be part of the, uh, you know, part of a shaft, or is it just kind of plating that's been bent over, just in that perfect arc? I think, I think, I think it's hull plating that's bent, bent over into in, in to the interior, because it's all it seems connected to the the exterior. Got it. Great. That was a thought from um, Frank Thompson at Naval History and Heritage Command. Okay. Yeah. Mike, the uh, inboard part of this piece looks like it's bent up and back towards it, so I can try and get a zoom if we tilt up. Sure. Yeah. We tilt up a little there, Tito, and try and get that furthest. Yeah, look right there. Thank you. Sliding does add depth. Kind of top of frame right now, and now it's out of frame. But you see it in that it was. That part right there. All right, coming out. Full light.
Oh yeah, so John's uh, uh, guessing that there's uh, there were some openings along the along not the uh, it's not the hangar deck, but one of the decks, um, and this could be like the space between them, and we're seeing the underside of these openings. It's possible. Yeah, so that... Mm. I'll have to look at it later. I don't want to look down now. Dark, our move should be taking us off to starboard. Should be. Uh, ROV starboard. Uh, yeah. Uncertainty in the USBL positioning is popping around quite a bit on yeah. high pack. So, well, it's one percent error every time you read one percent of depth. Try to pull back another five meters if you like. Yeah, I, I'd like to not be directly over the wreck. At least not at this point. Thank you. Sure. Bridge nav. Like to do a ship move five meters bearing two zero five. Thank you. That's always a good point, you know, just because it's flat in this area doesn't mean that there aren't obstructions and higher prominent structure yeah. for a raft. And in fact, often in underwater archaeology, the strongest parts of the hulls are the, the, the bow and the stern, given their triangular construction. So sometimes you see those prominent on the seafloor. In the middle, you'll have boilers or engines, yeah. everything else being flattened. But we are thankful today for the sea state in Papahanao Mokuakea and lucky yeah. because dives to this depth mean that we deploy so much cable, so much weight, that the weather window for conducting a survey like this is very narrow and the conditions have to be just right. So even so you're seeing some gentle heaving up and down on the seafloor, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good condition to conduct the survey. And I would say, we're watching the, the video with that motion of the ROV 3.3 miles beneath us, sitting in a darkened control van, which is doing its own motion hmm. on the ship on the surface, which makes for a very interesting experience. I didn't even take my, uh, my motion signal today. <laughs> I'll be all right, right. though. Right. Yeah, conditions have been so beautiful, though. When you look at the ocean, we've been really blessed. And, you know, that window of opportunity has really opened up for us. So how grateful are we to be able to do this? The uh, camera we're using on Atalanta is a single sensor uh, running at 30 frames. So unfortunately, in this low light, I don't know if you can see it back there, science, but we get that banding, kind of a circular yeah. banding, uh, which is not a big deal for us. But compressing and decompressing and recompressing this signal it probably really gets accentuated uh, through our chain, so it's probably much worse on shore. Mm. Um, I was able to take some test images from Yorktown stills, but same process applies to video, and dramatically clean them up. So uh, this is the raw initial capture, and there's a lot more that can be derived. Oh, see that little spoked like train wheel down there? Um, 
I can uh, uh, show you those images after this dive and hopefully give you some hope for what we're capturing here. we're going over this. Yeah. For those who are just joining us, um, welcome, aloha, um, konnichiwa to our Japanese colleagues or um, friends who are joining us from across the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, in Polynesia, we call the Pacific Ocean Moana Nui Akea, the great expanse of ocean, largest ocean in the world. Um, we believe this to be the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga. And I was wondering if um, either Mike or Hans could tell us some of those defining characteristics that would confirm that this is actually the Kaga? Yeah, um, well, f I mean, first of all, it's, it was documented um, in part of it in 19, uh, 1999 and then again in 2019 with, with and then ROV dives. Um, so we're fairly confident in our colleagues' previous uh, identifications. Uh, but what we're looking at there's going to be some features like the casemate guns, uh, the bow and the stern, the overall length of the vessel, the location of the tower and the uh, smokestack, um, but also the level of damage we're seeing here is consistent um, with its sinking. Um, the other carriers that were sunk were not struck as badly as this one, so e just even how low relief it is and the level of damage we're seeing is, is pretty fair confirmation as to the wreck that we're on. I just saw a ladder in there somewhere. Ed always thinking he's seeing ladders, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Anytime I see a 90, like yeah. three or four of them in a row. And can you remind us where we are or what part of the ship that we're looking at right now? Are we towards the bow <laughs> or the stern? Do we know? Uh. We think we're about almost exactly amidships, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, we're still working on that. Mm -hmm. We've we've only uh, moved a little ways since since acquiring the wreck, so it's going to take a little bit longer before we can truly dial in where we are. Mm -hmm. We're pretty sure that we're uh, about amidships, but we're moving um, we're moving slowly towards the stern to to okay. get a better sense of that. Port side amidships, yeah. mo moving right towards the stern. We're 85% on that. <laughs> nice, thank you. And, and that has to agree with the uh, with the sonar image we were looking at when we first yeah. approached. Can we zoom on that raised feature there? Anemones for Sebastian. <laughs> and are there sponges too? Or yeah, I'm more anemones? interested in that sponge at the yeah. very top of it. Because we haven't got a super clear look at those. You're probably not going to get a super clear look at any of this, but... Um, huh. We had a suggestion from Shoreside, you know, possible... Oh, it's, um, Jeff Morris That's from amazing. Asimar Research pointing out that you can, you can just about see some of this damage that's been falling off um, in that 2019 side scan sonar image that was generated by Vulcan Incorporated uh, in partnership with uh, Navy History and Heritage Command. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff and I go back a bit. We were at East Carolina University together. Hawaii. Derek, is it possible we could put in a, 
like a move directly off site just to kind of get us back. Uh, yeah, backing uh, like, the vehicle away from the wreck. Yeah, like five meters backwards. Sure. Uh, what, what was your heading when you were just spot directly facing the wreck? Zero two five. So two oh five. Thank you. Yeah, do you think five meters backing off will be enough? Yeah. Bridge, nav. We'd like to do a ship move. Five meters, bearing two zero five. Thank you. Yeah. Once we do that, we can um, we can continue moving. Uh, was it one two zero? Yeah, it was one one zero. Looks like one two zero it might be a little better. Before the ADA. Hey Nautilus, um, ECC here. Uh, just checking in to see if we can't uh, confirm comms with my co-lead scientist ashore, Dr. James Delgado. Jim, can you hear us okay and, uh, and get on the line? So, Phil, presumably he's right. calling in? Jim's calling in uh, just for a bit, so we're configuring okay. some of that stuff, but he's, uh, he's following and tracking, and we got him over cell as well. Thank you again, John Parshall Ashore. We're reading your notes online, and uh, you're right, this is pretty low down, so it might be hard to say if the bomb hit did this or subsequent explosions continued the damage further down to these lower decks. We're so low that we're, we might be looking at the engineering spaces at the very bottom of the ship. Hey, Nautilus, do you see some of the curvature there on that, on that combing just in the center of view? I mean, yeah. I mean, is that, is that possible? It could be part of the, uh, you know, part of a shaft, or is it just kind of plating that's been bent over, just in that perfect arc? I think, I think, I think it's hull plating that's bent, bent over into in into the interior, because it's all it seems connected to the the exterior. Got it, great. That was a thought from um, Frank Thompson at Naval History and Heritage Command. Okay, yeah. Mike, the uh, inboard part of this piece looks like it's bent up and back towards it, so I can try and get a zoom if we tilt up. Sure, yeah. We tilt up a little there, Tito, and try and get that further. Yeah, like right there, thank you. Sliding does add depth. Kind of top of frame right now, and now it's out of frame. But you see what I meant? It was. That part right there. All right, coming out. Full light.
Oh yeah, so John's uh, uh, guessing that there's uh, there were some openings along the along not the uh, it's not the hangar deck, but one of the decks, um, and this could be like the space between them, and we're seeing the underside of these openings. It's possible. Yeah, so that... Mm, I'll have to look at it later. I don't want to look down now. Derek, our move should be taking us off to starboard. Should be. Uh, ROV starboard. Uh, yeah. A lot of uncertainty in the USBL positioning is popping around quite a bit on yeah. high pack. So one's one percent error every time you read one percent depth. Try to pull back another five meters if you like. Yeah, I, I'd like to not be directly over the wreck. At least not at this point. Thank you. Sure. Bridge nav. Like to do a ship move five meters bearing two zero five. Thank you. That's always a good point, you know, just because it's flat in this area doesn't mean that there aren't obstructions and higher prominent structure yeah. for a raft. And in fact, often in underwater archaeology, the strongest parts of the hulls are the, the, the bow and the stern, given their triangular construction. So sometimes you see those prominent on the seafloor. In the middle, you'll have boilers or engines, yeah. everything else being flattened. But we are thankful today for the sea state in Papahanao, Mokuakea, and lucky yeah. because dives to this depth mean that we deploy so much cable, so much weight, that the weather window for conducting a survey like this is very narrow and the conditions have to be just right. So even so, you're seeing some gentle heaving up and down on the seafloor. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a good condition to conduct the survey. And I would say, we're watching the, the video with that motion of the ROV 3.3 miles beneath us sitting in a darkened control van which is doing its own motion yeah. on the ship on the surface which makes for a very interesting experience. I didn't even take my, uh, my motion sick pills today. <laughs> I'll be all right, right. though. Right. Yeah, conditions have been so beautiful though. When you look at the ocean, we've been really blessed. And, you know, that window of opportunity has really opened up for us. So how grateful are we to be able to do this? The uh, camera we're using on Atalanta is a single sensor uh, running at 30 frames. So unfortunately, in this low light, I don't know if you can see it back there, science, but we get that banding, kind of a circular yeah. banding, uh, which is not a big deal for us. But compressing and decompressing and recompressing this signal it probably really gets accentuated uh, through our chain, so it's probably much worse on shore. Mm. Um, I was able to take some test images from Yorktown stills, but same process applies to video, and dramatically clean them up. So uh, this is the raw initial capture, and there's a lot more that can be derived. Oh, see that little spoked like train wheel down there? Um, 
I can uh, uh, show you those images after this dive and hopefully give you some hope for what we're capturing here. we're going over this. Yeah. For those who are just joining us, um, welcome, aloha, um, konnichiwa to our Japanese colleagues or um, friends who are joining us from across the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, in Polynesia, we call the Pacific Ocean Moana Nui Akea, the great expanse of ocean, largest ocean in the world. Um, we believe this to be the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga. And I was wondering if um, either Mike or Hans could tell us some of those defining characteristics that would confirm that this is actually the Kaga? Yeah, um, well, f I mean, first of all, it's, it was documented um, in part of it in 19, uh, 1999 and then again in 2019 with, with and then ROV dives. Um, so we're fairly confident in our colleagues' previous uh, identifications. Uh, but what we're looking at there's going to be some features like the casemate guns, uh, the bow and the stern, the overall length of the vessel, the location of the tower and the uh, smokestack, um, but also the level of damage we're seeing here is consistent um, with its sinking. Um, the other carriers that were sunk were not struck as badly as this one, so e just even how low relief it is and the level of damage we're seeing is, is pretty fair confirmation as to the wreck that we're on. I just saw a ladder in there somewhere. Ed always thinking he's seeing ladders, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Anytime I see a 90, or yeah. three or four of them in a row. And can you remind us where we are or what part of the ship that we're looking at right now? Are we towards the bow <laughs> or the stern? Do we know? Uh. We think we're about almost exactly amidships, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, we're still working on that. Mm -hmm. we've, we've only uh, moved a little ways since, since acquiring the wreck, so it's going to take a little bit longer before we can truly dial in where we are. Mm -hmm. We're pretty sure that we're uh, about amidships, but we're moving, um, we're moving slowly towards the stern to, okay. to get a better sense of that. Port side amidships, yeah. mo moving right towards the stern. We're 85% on that. <laughs> nice, thank you. And, and that has to agree with the uh, with the sonar image we were looking at when we first yeah. approached. Can we zoom on that raised feature there? Anemones for Sebastian. <laughs> and are there sponges too? Or yeah, I'm more anemones? interested in that sponge at the yeah. very top of it. Because we haven't got a super clear look at those. You're probably not going to get a super clear look at any of this, but... Um, we had a suggestion from Shoreside, you know, possible ammunition hoist, but uh, hard to say. Huh? Ammunition hoist, but uh, hard to say. Thank you. Thank you.
So what is this train rail like feature we're looking at? I think that's the uh, the interior of the bulkhead. Um, so the this part it looks like the hull plating has ba has been bent outwards, uh, and that's the inner structure of the of the outer hull. And so this protrusion that we're seeing down on the right that it's could have been small. It could have been one of the supports for uh, one of the gun mounts. And do you know how far apart the ribs are? Mm, that's a good question. Those are frames, though, and yeah. then the the long stringers along the side are the frames and stringers, steel construction. There's a very large cylinder. Well, I think it's large, uh, inboard, just forward of where this section ends, kind of right there. That shows up on anyone else's monitor. That thing. That's out. got some type of uh, fan pinion or? on the oh, yeah. other side, or a cooling fan. Looks more like a dry well, pinion. We'll get further over there. Now that looks like one of the anvil-looking things I talked about on Akagi, that I never quite learned the use, the actual purpose for. Kind of looks like a wench to me, a little bit. Uh, this is the interior of the ship. Oh, maybe. Maybe it moved things around. So the ship moves are complete. It's taking a while to translate down yeah. to us. Um, we could try another five meter step. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's go five meters at like, oh. Uh, you're look, you, you can't see now. You're browsing pictures. Uh, what, me? <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm ROV pilot. <laughs> I'm doing a uh, system health check. Oh, no, I okay. I don't know. Um, I'm tr I can't see. Oh, I can look over Tito's shoulder. Um, so we're facing directly east right now. Let, we are facing directly east right let's now. Let's go five meters at 180. Um, yeah, we've been doing steps at 205. So, um, yeah, that works too. It's pretty close. Good morning, everybody. Hi, good morning. Bridge, Nav. Ship move, please. Five meters bearing two zero five. Five. Correct, thank you. So we have a viewer wondering with all of the heaving and like motion of Atalanta, like uh, how y'all are able to not bump into any of the wreck sites. And uh, like I can hear y'all discussing and kind of looking and seeing when you're maybe too close for comfort, but like what is this distance that we like to stay at? So this is Tito piloting Atalanta, mm -hmm. and I'm using both altimeter, sonar, and video image. And it, to me, it does seem like we get a little close, but then I look down and I see we're five meters away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm going to say for the heaves, if I get below five meters, I start dragging sediment up, creating a little bit of a vacuum when the, when the vehicle shoots up. So I'm trying to not get too low to cause sediment in the water, but trying to get those perfect video images. Yeah. And you said you were using what sonar? Is this the sonar that viewers are seeing too? To yes. Look? Yeah. Yeah. So what they're looking at in the sonar on uh, channel three mm -hmm. is um, it, it's a 360 scanning sonar that's mounted to the bottom of Atalanta, and um, you know, uh, black and uh, dark blue is you know <laughs> nothing. And then mm -hmm. we're seeing bright, brighter hits that go from like green to yellow to pink that uh, that show us where the wreck structure is. So mm -hmm. it's pretty zoomed in right now, um, but but we're able to see 
you know, that there's more wreck to in front of us as well as to both sides. Yeah. So like that dark area that we're seeing on the sonar kind of like in the wreck, is that like where we can see some of like the damage in the wreck, like on the sonar? I think that's more a gap because we're sitting right over it. Mm -hmm. Interpreting that sonar is a little bit of an art form. Mm -hmm. that, then, it, then it is a direct like image of what we're seeing. Ed, would you push? Yeah, coming in. Looking at that. Right there. I'm guessing. Just really not enough light to get a good sharp focus on that. We could also try to uh, move more towards the stern if you'd like to do a bigger move, see some different. Yeah, we can do that, uh, and it'll yeah, pull us off you. a little bit too. Uh, if if we do yeah. the uh, that larger movement might help us. Yeah, if we do like um, yeah, like 120. Yep. We're in a better uh, position to shoot that object now. So 20 meters at bearing 120. Does feel like we're falling away from the wreck a little. That's nice. Just a wee bit. Yep. Yeah. Not quite comfortable enough to go down in that. No. It, yeah, no. no. It, it could also be that <clears throat> this folded out part of the hull has protruded and we're just, as we're moving forward, we're just kind of skimming along that this, it seems at the same place, but not. It feels like the sediment has broken away and it's much lower now. What's your altimeter over here? Uh, right now I'm bouncing off the sediment, so 12, but I think that yeah. the hull is sticking up another eight or nine, so I'm just trying to balance that. Yep. Could you throw a zoom on that white object? Yeah, sure, you coming in. Bridge, nav. No, it's not a tie wrap. Please do a ship move two zero meters, bearing one two zero. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, nothing to see yeah. there. So I'm trying to figure out what that uh, motor may have been driving with that pinion. Could that have been an elevator motor, or that's a good it? that's a good theory. Um, yeah, we, we are. I'm going to say we're near the center of the ship at this point. Yeah. So this ship had um, a, an aft elevator, and the the mid, the midships elevator was actually kind of far forward. Um, but it could be in the area that we're in. It's not too far. It's also a little, it's shaded to port. Or no, to starboard, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of on the other side of the ship, though. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if, I mean, they could have had motors for smaller elevators to move ammunition up and down to the guns. I wanted to take a second to recognize that we have viewers from all over the world right now um, tuning in and watching this with us. I'm counting, I think, like 18 different countries um, of folks that are viewing the Nautilus live site right now. Um, and if we have anyone over on YouTube, um, if you come join us on nautiluslive.org, you can check out bios of not only folks that are in the van with us, but also some of our shoreside colleagues. 
and read a little bit about their backgrounds and how they've gotten involved with this field of study. Um, and you can also leave us some messages or questions in the chat. Wow. Get that from my marina. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm going to be listed on this watch, though. There are some of us in the van yeah, that that's a good point. come from other watches. So yeah. If they go to Expedition right. and click on the name of our expedition, which is Ala Aumuana Kaiuli, they can see, I believe, all of us and the Shoreside colleagues, but I don't know if all of them are included. Yeah, we've, we've altered the, the watch roster a, a bit for these mm -hmm. archaeological dives, so both Mike and I can be in here because um, I tried to take a rest yesterday while the Akaga dive was going on, and uh, I won't do something like that again. So I'm in here for the duration. You are? Yeah. Wow. Oh, I think you're muted, Mike. I'll say that I, uh, I might attempt that too, but we'll see how the day goes. You might attempt taking a break. We'll and, see. Yeah. Do we, we know do? everybody that's on uh, at the ECC right now uh, onshore or tuning in? Have we done full introductions? Uh, we didn't actually. There, I think there was a connection issue at the time. Um, oh, yeah. Phil, if you guys are there um, and, and on SPL, could you uh, do a quick round of introductions to who's uh, who's watching from the ECC? Tito, can we swim uh, around yeah, the park and see the rail going uh, forward it, just for a glance? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely not. Let's have too so much, Mike. Um, my name is Phil Hartmeyer. I'm a marine archaeologist at NOAA Ocean Exploration and the co-lead scientist ashore, along with uh, colleague Dr. James Delgado from Search Incorporated. We got a great room of partners and archaeologists, you know, scouring materials and uh, and, and, and data of our own, looking for clues to, to better interpret the site and uh, and learn as much as we can. Along with me is uh, Michael Murphy. I'm the NOAA Research Communications Director. Great to join. Thank you. Oh, this is Frank Pintello. I'm with uh, HMS Place and Jeff Morris. I'm an independent researcher working with Nautilus. Um, I was involved in originally um, finding the first piece of Kaga back in 1999 in a joint AF effort with the Naval Oceanographic Office. Um, and I'm an arch underwater archaeologist at ECU. My name is Sam Clare. I'm an expedition coordinator for NOAA Ocean Exploration, and my background is in marine archaeology. Hello, everyone. I'm Alexis Kassambis. Uh I have the Navy's underwater archaeology program at the Naval Heritage Command. Hey, everyone. I'm Joe Hoyt. I'm a maritime archaeologist by training and uh, work for the Office of Navigation, uh, Marine Navigation Operations at NOAA as a diving program manager. So this one's a little too deep for us to dive. Uh, <laughs> We're happy to be here uh, watching this uh, through the, uh, the, the technology that's in the project there on this research. And also joining us is uh, Frank Thompson, uh, who is with the Naval History and Heritage Command. He's presently the uh, lead to the collection management. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Mike. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great to have you all online. Yeah. That's it's quite an impressive pool of expertise. <laughs> it's a bit daunting, frankly. It's wonderful to have the input from shore. Guys, I think what we're looking at um, with the uh, six holes in there, I th uh, John and I think that's the base of the five inch sponson, which uh, is a word he's uh, Thank you. Thank you.
So what is this train rail like feature we're looking at? I think that's the uh, the interior of the bulkhead. Um, so the this part looks like the hull plating has ba has been bent outwards, uh, and that's the inner structure of the of the outer hull. And so this protrusion that we're seeing down on the right that could have been small. It could have been one of the supports for uh, one of the gun mounts. And do you know how far apart the ribs are? Mm, that's a good question. Those are frames, though, and yeah. then the the long stringers along the side are the frames and stringers, steel construction. There's a very large cylinder. Well, I think it's large. Uh, in board, just forward of where this section ends, kind of right there. That shows up on anyone else's monitor. That thing. Uh, and that's out. got some type of uh, fan pinion or? on the oh, yeah. left side, or a cooling fan. Looks more like a dry well, pinion. We'll get further over there. Oh, that looks like one of the anvil-looking things I talked about on Akagi that I never quite learned the use, the actual purpose for. That looks like a winch to me. A little bit. Uh, this is the interior of the ship. Oh, maybe. Maybe it moved things around. I don't know. So the ship moves are complete. It's taking a while to translate down yeah. to us. Um, we could try another five meter step. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's go five meters at like, oh. Uh, you're look, you, you can't see now. You're browsing pictures. Uh, what, me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm ROV doing pilot. <laughs> I'm doing uh, a system health check. Oh. No, I... Okay, I don't know. Um, I'm tr I can't see... Oh, I can look over Tito's shoulder. Um, so we're facing directly east right now? Let we are facing directly east right let's now. Let's go five meters at 180. Yeah, we've been doing steps at 205, so... Um, yeah, that works too. It's pretty close. Good morning, everybody. Hi, good morning. Bridge, Nav. Ship move, please, five meters, bearing 205. Five. Correct. Thank you. So we have a viewer wondering with all of the heaving and like motion of Atalanta, like uh, how y'all are able to not bump into any of the wreck sites. And uh, like I can hear y'all discussing and kind of looking and seeing when you're maybe too close for comfort. But like, what is this distance? that we like to stay at. So this is Tito piloting Atalanta, mm -hmm. and I'm using both altimeter, sonar, and video image. And it, to me, it does seem like we get a little close, but then I look down and I see we're five meters away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm gonna say for the heaves, if I get below five meters, I start dragging sediment up, creating a little bit of a vacuum when the, when the vehicle shoots up. So I'm trying to not get too low to cause sediment in the water but trying to get those perfect video images. Yeah. And you said you were using what sonar? Is this the sonar that viewers are seeing too? To yes. Look? Yeah. Yeah, so what they're looking at in the sonar on uh, channel three mm -hmm. is um, it, it's a 360 scanning sonar that's mounted to the bottom of Atalanta. And, um, you know, uh, black and uh, dark blue is you know, nothing. And then mm -hmm. we're seeing bright, brighter hits that go from like green to yellow to pink that uh, that show us where the wreck structure is. So it's pretty zoomed in right now. Um, but but we're able to see, you know, that there's more wreck to 
in front of us as well as to both sides. Yeah. So like that dark area that we're seeing on the sonar kind of like in the wreck, is that like where we can see some of like the damage in the wreck, like on the sonar? I think that's more a gap because we're sitting right over it. Mm -hmm. Interpreting that sonar is a little bit of an art form. Mm -hmm. That then it, then it is a direct like image of what we're seeing. Ed, would you push? Yeah, coming in. Looking at that. Right there. I'm guessing. just really not enough light to get a good sharp focus on that. We could also try to uh, move more towards the stern if you'd like to do a bigger move, see some different. Yeah, we can do that uh, and it'll yeah, pull us off you. a little bit too. Uh, if, if we do yeah. the... Uh, that larger movement might help us. Yeah, if we do like, um, yeah, like 120. Yep. We're in a better uh, position to shoot that object now. So 20 meters at bearing 120. Does feel like we're falling away from the wreck a little. That's nice. Just a wee bit. Yep. Yeah. Not quite comfortable enough to go down in that. No. It, yeah, yeah, no. It, it could also be that <clears throat> this folded out part of the hull has protruded and we're just, as we're moving forward, we're just kind of skimming along. That this, it seems at the same place, but not. It feels like the sediment has broken away and it's much lower now. What's your altimeter over here? Uh, right now I'm bouncing off the sediment, so 12. But I think that yeah. the hull is sticking up another eight or nine, so I'm just trying to balance that. Yep. Could you throw a zoom on that white object? Yeah, sure. You coming in? Bridge, nav. No, it's not a tie wrap. Please do a ship move two zero meters, bearing one two zero. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, nothing to see yeah. there. Yep. So I'm trying to figure out what that uh, motor may have been driving with that pinion. Could that have been an elevator motor, or that's a good in? that's a good theory. Um, yeah, we, we are. I'm going to say we're near the center of the ship at this point. Yeah. So this ship had um, a, an aft elevator, and the the mid, the midships elevator was actually kind of far forward. Um, but it could be in the area that we're in. It's not too far. It's also a little, it's shaded to port. Or no, to starboard, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of on the other side of the ship, though. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if, I mean, they could have had motors for smaller elevators to move ammunition up and down to the guns. I wanted to take a second to recognize that we have viewers from all over the world right now um, tuning in and watching this with us. I'm counting, I think, like 18 different countries um, of folks that are viewing the Nautilus live site right now. Um, and if we have anyone over on YouTube, um, if you come join us on nautiluslive.org, you can check out bios of not only folks that are in the van with us, but also some of our shoreside colleagues. 
and read a little bit about their backgrounds and how they've gotten involved with this field of study. Um, and you can also leave us some messages or questions in the chat. Wow. Get that from my marina. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to be listed on this watch, though. There are some of us in the van yeah, that that's a good point. come from other watches. So yeah. If they go to Expedition right. and click on the name of our expedition, which is Ala Al Moana Kaiuli, they can see, I believe, all of us and the Shoreside colleagues, but I don't know if all of them are included. Yeah, we've, we've altered the, the watch roster a, a bit for these mm -hmm. archaeological dives, so both Mike and I can be in here because um, I tried to take a rest yesterday while the Akaga dive was going on, and uh, I won't do something like that again. So I'm in here for the duration. You are? Yeah. Wow. Oh, I think you're muted, Mike. I'll say that I, uh, I might attempt that too, but we'll see how the day goes. You might attempt taking a break. We'll and, see. Yeah. Do we, we know do? everybody that's on uh, at the ECC right now uh, onshore or tuning in? Have we done full introductions? Uh, we didn't actually. There, I think there was a connection issue at the time. Um, oh, yeah. Phil, if you guys are there um, and, and on SPL, could you uh, do a quick round of introductions to who's, uh, who's watching from the ECC? Tito, can we swim uh, around yeah, the park absolutely. and see the rail going? Uh, forward it just for a glance. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely not. Let's have too so much, Mike. Um, my name is Phil Hartmeyer. I'm a marine archaeologist at NOAA Ocean Exploration and the co lead scientist ashore, along with uh, colleague Dr. James Delgado from Search Incorporated. We got a great room of partners and archaeologists, you know, scouring materials and, uh, and, okay, and, and data of our own, looking for clues to to better interpret the site and, uh, and learn as much as we can. Along with me is... Uh, Michael Murphy, I'm the NOAA Research Communications Director. Great to join, thank you. Oh, this is Frank Pintello. I'm with uh, HMS Place. Yeah. Jeff Morris, I'm an uh, independent researcher working with Nautilus. Um, I was involved in originally um, finding the first piece of Kaga back in 1999 and, joint effort with the Naval Oceanographic Office and I'm an underwater archaeologist at ECU. My name is Sam Clare. I'm an expedition coordinator for NOAA Ocean Exploration and my background is in marine archaeology. Hello everyone. I'm Alexis Katsambis. Uh, I have the Navy's underwater archaeology program at the Naval Sea Harris Command. Hey everyone. I'm Joe Hoyt. I'm a maritime archaeologist by training and uh, work for the Office of uh, bring aviation operations at NOAA as a diving program manager. So this one's a little too deep for us to dive. Uh, so we're happy to be here uh, watching this uh, through the, uh, the, the technology that's in the project there on this research. And also joining us is uh, Frank Thompson, uh, who is with the Naval History and Heritage Command. He's presently the uh, lead to collection management. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Mike. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great to have you all online. Yeah. It's, it's quite an impressive pool of expertise. <laughs> it's a bit daunting, frankly. It's wonderful to have the input from shore. Guys, I think what we're looking at um, with the uh, six holes in there, I uh, John and I think that's the base of the five-inch sponson, which uh, is a word he's uh, j recently taught me. That was one of the supports for um, one of the gun. J recently taught me that was one of the supports for um, one of the gun tubs uh, that would have been uh, higher up from here. Sponson. I hadn't heard that word before. Mm -hmm. So after hearing that round of introductions, um, I'm just thinking about like the collaboration that we're witnessing and the interdisciplinary nature of what we're doing. And I, just, I have a question. This can be for Mike or Hans in the van or any of our colleagues ashore. Um, how often do you have the opportunity like this in your career to like gather 
um, with other maritime archaeologists than like experience this together? Like, is this common for you to share something like this with one another? Well, I would say, you know, given the, the really wonderful and advanced capabilities of Nautilus mm -hmm. to conduct this type of real-time investigation and communication, and it's not easy. I know it took months to set this up mm -hmm. and quite a bit of technical support that it is not common yeah. that we get to do something like this. This is a wonderful experience, and it's also shared live with the public. So yeah. this is truly a different way to conduct exploration and archaeology and the biology and geology mm -hmm. that's part of this mission as well um, in a very exciting way, an mm -hmm. accessible way. And, you know, speaking as someone who works for a public agency, that that accessibility is wonderful. Yeah. And this it, is what we should be doing. So I'm very appreciative and it's it's not that common. Yeah. And that's, I, I'll say too, like, I'm just so appreciative. I've got high school students in North Carolina that have been tuning in and listening and watching and going along with us. So that accessibility is just so, so important. Um, and I'm curious now too, Hans, like how often is it that you are working with, like like here on the ship, we've got biologists, geologists, like so many different uh, other people that are like sharing this experience with you. Is that common for your work? Well, ship time is at a premium. So I would mm -hmm. say that, that I've always been impressed with the effort to allocate you know um, resources and time and when ships are planning their expeditions uh, whether they're OET ships or NOAA ships that it's often multidisciplinary mm -hmm. I think as it should be because ultimately the archaeology that we're looking at is in direct relation in, has a direct relationship to its impact on the marine environment and ecosystem right and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, its habitat, it can be potential threat. It's got long-term implications for the ecosystem, as we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. The iron going into the sediment was changing mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the microorganisms. Mm -hmm. The bacteria mat? The, the micro microbial yeah. mat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are all kinds of considerations that that don't respect the kind of disciplinary pigeonholes that we mm -hmm. often were, were trained in when we were in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I'll true. say that's something that's like, uh, sorry, go ahead, Derek. I was just wondering if that bright white that we're seeing is some sort of marine debris or trash oh. that drifted in. Ed, would you throw a push at that? I think that's a good guess. Yeah, it just doesn't look as old as the uh, rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ed. I just wanted to chime in real quick and say that this is the highest density of the white anemones we've seen across all three racks is under this bed piece of hole. And it's funny, they're so dense on the uh, underside. They like to hang out. Do you want to zoom? Um, we don't have to zoom, but it's up to you guys. Hey, hey Nautilus, a uh, quick thought on that uh, mount just, uh, just forward of where we are. So that flange that we're seeing with the bolt pattern, we think might be one of the supports for the port side artillery mount, um, probably number six. Um, and uh, there's a, a couple of angles for used to bear that up the side of the gunnel. And we think that we're seeing just the very bottom section of that uh, where the, um, where the, where the, the 12, the 12, the 12, the 12. Oh yeah, well, the, well, the 12.7 centimeter anti-aircraft guns would have been mounted. So we're we're right at the base, we think, uh, of where that where that that mount was buried into the hull. Roger, thank you, Shore Side. Is are we looking at the correct support here in the visual? Yeah, yeah, that's, 
and you can see how it's fared in below that bracket. Yes. You can see in the, the plans that we're looking at, um, there's an angle right there above the line where the portholes are. Yes. So I, think we're, I think the top is sheared off, but it's just that bottom section. I think it's the number eight uh, artillery now. Or, I'm sorry, number six artillery now. Thank you, Short Team. Is, is that the one that's furthest aft towards the stern? I'm just trying to get oriented on the, the drawing. I'm back on comps. Nav, it's probably the one midships or like uh, in between. Uh, it's probably yeah. See, the drawing that I that I gave you is the wrong um, the wrong side, but it's probably the one um, before yeah, the before the push. case before the casemate guns. Thank you. So we're in the middle of our 20 meter move? Uh, I believe we're done that now. All right, that was a good, um, that helped us get to the right spot off the wreck. Um, so if we could do like a slightly less, well, maybe still at 120, another 20 meters. Understood. Maybe 115. Um, I'm just going to um, zero 090, zero, and I'm still looking at a little offset with the uh, sonar image of about 20 degrees. So I think anything over 110 to 115 is going to be right around the money. You want to go with 115? Yeah. Yes. All right. Bridge, nav. A ship move, please. Two zero meters, bearing one one five. Thank you. Thank you, short team, and thank you, John, on the science chat. It really helps us, you know, confirm and and feel more positive about our our position, how far fore and aft we are on the port side. So it looks like another one uh, of those large tie-down points or shackles. That bridge is calling you. Go ahead, bridge. Bearing 115. Thank you. Say again, pilot. Yeah, it looks like another one. Of, I, I, I can only think that it looks like a big tie-down oh, point. Oh, here. Yeah, I see that. In the center. Yeah. We've seen a couple of those. And are those uh, tie-down points for resting gear or... We were um, we were looking at those earlier. I think they might be like anchors for um, for line, or we? for for yeah for tie downs for. Uh, we're, what? Oh, well, we're still pretty low down. Yeah, we're oh. we're pretty far below the flight deck. No, I don't mean on the Sorry, flight Mike. deck. I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, oh. it's not arresting gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I think just ties for like various cabling that that was probably coming along. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen those before where they stick out like that. Because one of them was adjacent to the portholes, which was odd to me. Um, See, so yeah, I wasn't sure, but yeah, probably some something that ran where they could tie off um, some of these cables that we see draping around. Some of their mm -hmm. cylinder just in board Ma there Maybe in the dark some of shape. Hans's favorite cables for Left the de degaussing. Right. Thank you for thank you for mentioning that. Yep. Okay. The thing right in there. Um, maybe it's on a cylinder. Could be square. Maybe a vent. <laughs> Cut into the deck. Man, this fuck 
focus. That's a um, large item. Uh, let me do a push. Uh, if you look at the down, not the vertical white, I don't think we're there yet. But this item underneath us, if you look at the right side of it, it stands proud of the seafloor quite a ways. To the right? Um, here, hold a sec. Hey, Nautilus, I mean, I, here. We, we, may be, we, we may be looking at one of those 12-7 gun tubs that you can see where it's sheared, and, you know, certainly, if that was the case, it's toppled, toppled from decks that are, from, are gone, obviously, now, but it could be overturned there. Yeah, possibly. That would put us a little further yeah. aft than the, the center support we're looking at for the gun platform high above. Perhaps, I, you know, it would be one of the three twelve seven anti-aircraft. Uh, can you tilt um, down just a little, uh, Tito? Yeah. Potentially the middle one. But the no, forward edge know. has a little more detail. Yeah, it, it may have been that, that uh, the one to the right, right there, the yeah. platform above. 12.7 centimeter, and that would put us directly next to the first casemate gun. All right. That's a possibility. Yeah. The, the the team here is looking at that platform that looks to be connected to it on the on the forward edge of it. Um, Perhaps could be indicative of that after 12-7 inch aircraft platform, um, which wasn't which wasn't uh, a part of the other two forward. Yeah. Another possibility, uh, thank you, John, on the chat, is an upside down 12.7 gun tub, which has fallen into the sediment. I can't be sure. I can't tell. inboard just aft of where we are. Could you speak up just a tad? Yeah, there's a circle uh, inboard uh, forward of that vertical white thing right frame center just now. See that? That's pretty large. helpful at all science that looks like a turret of some sort yeah, almost a bearing we're seeing yeah it doesn't yeah often what happens is you know the plans and references we have show us the complete vessel right so when we're we're looking at damaged areas and uh hull plates and bulwarks that are missing gone flight decks that are taken away we're dealing with interior schematics um which right. are not so common. Uh, and the vessel's purpose was changed from how it was laid. Uh, that would have been uh, higher up from here. Sponson, I hadn't heard that word before. Mm -hmm. So after hearing that round of introductions, um, I'm just thinking about like the collaboration that we're witnessing and the interdisciplinary nature of what we're doing. And I, just, I have a question. This can be for Mike or Hans in the van or any of our colleagues ashore. Um, how often do you have the opportunity like this in your career to like gather um, with other maritime archaeologists and like 
experience this together? Like, is this common for you to share something like this with one another? Well, I would say, you know, given the, the really wonderful and advanced capabilities of Nautilus mm -hmm. to conduct this type of real-time investigation and communication, and it's not easy. I know it took months to set this up mm -hmm. and quite a bit of technical support that it is not common yeah. that we get to do something like this. This is a wonderful experience and it's also shared live with the public. So yeah. this is truly a different way to conduct exploration and archaeology and the biology and geology mm -hmm. that's part of this mission as well um, in a very exciting way and mm -hmm. accessible way. And, you know, speaking as someone who works for a public agency, that that accessibility is wonderful. Yeah. And it, this is what we should be doing. So I'm very appreciative and it's it's not that common. Yeah. And that's, I, I'll say too, like, I'm just so appreciative. I've got high school students in North Carolina that have been tuning in and listening and watching and going along with us. So that accessibility is just so, so important. Um, and I'm curious now too, Hans, like how often is it that you are working with, like, like here on the ship, we've got biologists, geologists, like so many different uh, other people that are like sharing this experience with you. Is that common for your work? Well, ship time is at a premium. So I would mm -hmm. say that, that I've always been impressed with the effort to allocate, you know, um, resources and time. And when ships are planning their expeditions, uh, whether they're OET ships or NOAA ships, that it's often multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. I think as it should be, because ultimately the archaeology that we're looking at is in direct relation, in, has a direct relationship to its impact on the marine environment and ecosystem. Right. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, its habitat, it can be potential threat. It's got long-term implications for the ecosystem, as we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. The iron going into the sediment was changing mm -hmm. the... Uh, the, the microorganisms, mm -hmm. the bacteria mat, the the micro we microbial at, yeah. mat, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So there are all kinds of considerations that that don't respect the kind of disciplinary pigeonholes that mm -hmm. we often were were trained in when we were in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I'll true. say that's something that's like. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Derek. I was just wondering if that bright white that we're seeing is some sort of marine debris or trash oh. that drifted in. Ed, would you throw a push at that? I think that's a good guess. Yeah, it just doesn't look as old as the uh, rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ed. I just wanted to chime in real quick and say that this is the highest density of the white anemones we've seen across all three racks is under this bed piece of hole. And it's funny, they're so dense on the uh, underside. They like to hang out. Do you want to zoom? Um, we don't have to zoom, but it's up to you guys. Hey, hey Nautilus, a uh, quick thought on that uh, mount just, uh, just forward of where we are. So that flange that we're seeing with the bolt pattern, we think might be one of the supports for the port side artillery mount, um, probably number six. Um, and uh, there's a, a couple of angles for used to bear that up the side of the gunnel. And we think that we're seeing just the very bottom section of that uh, where the, um, where the, I'm sorry, for the 12, the 12, 7, okay. Oh yeah, was it was a 12.7 centimeter anti-aircraft gun would have been mounted. So we're we're right at the base, we think, uh, of where that where that that mount was there into the hull. Roger, thank you, Shore Side. Is are we looking at the correct support here in the visual? Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's correct. And you can see how it's paired in below that bracket. 
yes. you can see in the, the plans that we're looking at, um, there's an angle right there above the line where the portholes are. Yes. So I, think we're, I think the top is sheared off, so it's just that bottom section. I think it's the number eight uh, artillery panel. Or, I'm sorry, number six artillery panel. Thank you, short team. Is, is that the one that's furthest aft towards the stern? I'm just trying to get oriented on the, the drawing. I'm back on comps. Nav, it's probably the one Midships are like uh, in between. Uh, it's probably yeah. See the drawing that I that I gave you is the wrong um, the wrong side, but it's probably the one um, before the before the case before the casemate guns. Thank you. So we're in the middle of our 20 meter move? Uh, I believe we're done that now. All right, that was a good, um, that helped us get to the right spot off the wreck. Um, so if we could do like a slightly less, well, maybe still at 120, another 20 meters. Understood. Maybe 115. Um, I'm just going to um, zero 090, zero, and I'm still looking at a little offset with the uh, sonar image of about 20 degrees, so I think anything over 110 and 115 is going to be right around the money. You want to go with 115? Yeah. Yes. All right. Bridge, nav. A ship move, please. Two zero meters, bearing one one five. Thank you. Thank you, short team, and thank you, John, on the science chat. It really helps us, you know, confirm and and feel more positive about our our position, how far fore and aft we are on the port side. So it looks like another one uh, of those large tie-down points or shackles. Nav yeah, Bridge is calling you. Go ahead, Bridge. Bearing 115. Thank you. Say again, pilot. Yeah, it looks like another one. Of, I, I, I can only think that it looks like a big tie-down oh, point. Oh, here. Yeah, I see that. In the center. Yeah. We've seen a couple of those. And are those uh, tie-down points for resting gear or... We were um, we were looking at those earlier. I think they might be like anchors for um, for line, or really? for for yeah for tie downs for. Uh, we're, what? But well, we're still pretty low down. Yeah, we're oh. we're pretty far below the flight deck. No, I don't mean on the Sorry, flight Mike. deck. I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, oh. it's not arresting gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I think just ties for like various cabling that that was probably coming along. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen those before where they stick out like that. Because one of them was adjacent to the portholes, which was odd to me. Um, so yeah, I wasn't sure, but yeah, probably some something that ran where they could tie off um, some of these cables that we see draping around. Some of those mm -hmm. cylinder just in board Ma there Maybe in the dark some of shape. Hans's favorite cables for Left the right. degaussing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for thank you for mentioning that. Yep. Okay. The thing right in there. Oh, um, maybe it's on a cylinder. Could be square. Maybe a vent. <laughs> Cutting it into the deck. Man, let's focus. Oh, 
such a um, large item. Uh, let me do a push. Uh, if you look at the down, not the vertical white, I don't think we're there yet. But this item underneath us, if you look at the right side of it, it stands proud of the seafloor quite a ways. To the right? No, um, here, hold a sec. There's my hey, Nala, I mean, I, I, here. We, we, may be, we, we may be looking at one of those 12-7 gun tubs that you can see where it's sheared. And, you know, certainly, if that was the case, it's toppled toppled from decks that are from, are gone, obviously, now. But it could be overturned there. Yeah, possibly. That would put us a little further yeah. aft than the, the center support we're looking at for the gun platform high above. Perhaps I, you know, it would be one of the, the three twelve seven anti aircraft. Oh, can you tilt um, down just a little, Tito? Yeah. Potentially the middle one. But the no, forward no. edge has a little more detail. Yeah, it, it may have been that that the one to the right, right there, the yeah. platform above twelve point seven yeah, centimeter, absolutely. and that would put us That's directly next to the first casemate gun. All right. That's a possibility. Thank you. The, the, the team here is looking at that platform that looks to be connected to it on the on the forward edge of it. Um, perhaps could be indicative of that after 12-7 inch aircraft platform, um, which wasn't which wasn't uh, a part of the other two forward. Yeah. Another possibility. Uh, thank you, John, on the chat. Is an upside down 12.7 gun tub, which has fallen into the sediment. I can't be sure. I can't tell. inboard just aft of where we are. Could you speak up just a tad? Yeah, there's a circle uh, inboard uh, forward of that vertical white thing right frame center just now. See that? That's pretty large. Is that helpful at all, science? That looks like a turret of some sort. Yeah, Almost a bearing we're seeing. Yeah, it doesn't... Yeah, often what happens is, you know, the plans and references we have show us the complete vessel, right? So when we're, we're looking at damaged areas and uh, hull plates and bulwarks that are missing, gone, flight decks that are taken away, we're dealing with interior schematics, um, which right. are not so common. And the vessel's purpose was changed from how it was laid, so it could be yeah. a remnant of the original design. That yeah, initially. Laid, so it could be yeah. a remnant of the original design. That yeah, initially a battleship hull yeah. converted to aircraft carrier. Did that conversion happen during World War II? To I believe it was in the 1920s. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Japan's military was limited in the amount of certain types of vessels they could mm -hmm. build by the treaty after World War I. And I, I think there was a general feeling that the limitations were unfair. It's often called the 553 There's Treaty. There's another circle right there. The, the British and They've other Western it. powers got a ratio yeah. of five and five, and Japan got a ratio of three. And so they weren't allowed to lay down um, carrier hulls. And 
they had to convert them quickly uh, when the decision was made to do that. There's another one of these circles of uh, apparent equal diameter uh, further aft, but it appears to be standing taller than these, uh, almost a deck's worth maybe, off to our starboard. Right there, you can see the very top of it. It's almost white reflective at the top. Yep. Can we tilt tilt down, Tito, and get a look at that tub or circular? Yeah, yeah, that feature there. Study that a bit more. From the diagrams I have, the top of the casemates guns are have rounded domes, and I'm not seeing a rounded dome on that. But it th looks that like would be the support for it, right? What we're looking at that's standing up. This is the bottom of it they're conjecturing. Well, I'm, I'm just not sure what that is. If it's a gun tub upside down that's fallen from above or top of the first casemate gun. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's a casemate. Go ahead, shore side. Yeah, I, I, I like what you're thinking. It's uh, the aftermost. Uh, upside down, 12 depth. You know, Joe Hoyt uh, also mentioned that those cylinder holes in the interior shot potentially could be old gun mount from or deck mounted, you know, eight inch or larger. I'm not sure the armament and it was um, before it was converted, but those could have been, you know, Can you weapon mount. Tilt down just um, a little more, Tito. Sorry. Right. Thank you, Phil. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the comms are getting broken up a little bit. I hope it's a temporary aberration. Almost like there's a circle there that matches the ones we're seeing inboard. Yeah, but I was wondering the same. Yeah. Thank you, Tito. Could it be an old gun turret? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as we go back to our looking up uh, to our starboard, uh, there appears to be this one circle we're seeing on the far left one approximately screen center and then off to right there looks like there's another one but rising higher we'll see when we get there But it raises interesting questions, you know, if we're looking at things that potentially were higher up and fell over, that means they did it in place, that they were up there on the upper levels of the gun platforms mm -hmm. as the, the vessel hit the bottom and then fell over. But the destruction came, the tremendous destruction that the upper decks came from, the fires, explosions, and igniting the interior gas and air mixtures in the hangar which blew things out, which says there wasn't anything left when uh, the ship hit the bottom. Full white. So, interesting questions. Do we Tom, have, can you uh, hear us any better here at the ECC? Uh, broken up, shoreside. I'm able to make you out shore, but there's a little intermittent gaps in your audio. Do we know if this wreck drifted far from where it was appeared to sink? It did drift after the attack. And I believe it was under power still. Although the decision made to send the torpedoes into the hull and scuttle the ship was, I think, later that evening rather than in, in uh, Akagi's fate the next day, early morning. But yes, it's it's not in the location where the uh, attack happened. And there's that uh, item I was referring to. I don't know what that white is. 
I'm so impressed and I, and I think for all of our viewers, it's so important to understand, you know, that although we're sitting here with these views of this site, you know, there's still, oh. amid gone? the destruction and with so much confusion still, yeah. you know, unclear still what exactly we're looking at. Um, I think that's poignant that this isn't just, you know, look and see, this really is an active investigation. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right. That is the casemate gun. That's a great shot. Coming out a little bit. 20 centimeter casemate. Yep, one of 10 20 centimeter casemate guns carried very low down towards the water line remnant of the design of the original battleship hull. They're going to have to wait till we get further down to get a good shot there. Um, and, and, it, and it looks like we killed it. I mean... Can one of our archaeology team talk us through a casemate gun? What makes it different than others? One, two, three, four, five, right there. Uh, studio. Uh, let me uh, turn you up, Megan. I'm not sure we heard that. Uh, Thanks, which studio are you on? I'm on Studio One. Studio One, I stand by. I can also speak up as there though it is not five I got in the you. morning. Thank I just you. gave you a nice boost. Phil or anyone on the archaeology team, could you explain for us a casemate gun and what makes it different from the others? Well, sure. And, and jump in here, Mike Hans, others. Uh, casemates are certainly heavier guns that were lower in the water line. And are, are remnants from older naval strategies that were used in ship-to-ship -ship, uh, fighting and combat designed to pierce um, you know, holes of other vessels. So um, they were encased, they were protected, they were armored, and they represent often some of the largest armaments um, of, of battleships, and in this case, aircraft looks carriers. Like another that's intact gun just uh, aft. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Phil. It's, it's clear that, you know, this is designed to be a ship-to-ship -ship weapon rather than the kind of anti-aircraft weapons we were looking at higher up for aircraft carriers, which could often be elevated to 90 degrees. But, you know, from its Im embedded and armored shape as part of the hull itself, it, I think that's part of being a casemate gun. On yeah, the, and, and what above. makes it casemate is um, is that it's a uh, hull. It's mounted on the hull rather than on the deck, like it would be for a battleship or destroyer. I wonder, is that another mount for a casemate, and we're missing one? I think it is. I think one of them's uh. Yeah, this, uh, missing. this does yeah, have... Yeah, Looks to me like roller bearings. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the, one of the casemate guns was there. Is yeah. that what we're seeing upside down there? No. No, it's, no, it's the just right that's shape. the mount where the turret was. Yeah. Uh, so how many along each side were I? Coming? I think there were five. Five on this so one. So we can see four from here uh, if you look just yeah there uh, should be three just, just to the right here there's another uh, barrel sticking out yeah there should be three more to the right well after this one yep there's one but they're not perfectly in a even row there's oh I guess they are actually never mind disregard I can't really make out if there's another one down there or not yet. it's possible Do they have a domed top on these uh, yeah. semicircles yeah or yeah they were domed 
Thank you. So we get a push on this one. Head left or right? Uh, I was looking at the top of the uh, that area right there. So I believe we're done our movement aft. Would we like to do another step? Keep us yeah. moving along. Uh, yeah, yeah, sounds good. There we go. We'll do we're, a, we're at a great spot off the, right off offside the wreck. Pilot, would you like to keep that same heading? We were at one one five for that last move. Yes. So I'm looking at these uh, casemate guns, and I'm just like trying to imagine what they like sounded like when they were being used, um, like how they were used. Would this be something where like one person would stand back there and fire them? Do we know that? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but you, you, someone would be inside. Um, we don't actually know. I mean, o other versions were, of course, but we don't know if uh, either Kaga or Akagi ever actually fired them outside of practice because mm -hmm. they were never, their aircraft carriers, they weren't doing ship-to-ship -ship yeah. firing. I think they just kept them here because they were already installed when they yeah. were a, a cruiser in a battleship uh, hull. I don't think they were really ever... Right. I don't know. They may not have even carried ammunition for them. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they weren't ever intending to be, and they were never attacking ship to ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my guess would be they, they weren't used in the Battle of Midway at all. The mm -hmm. vessels never saw each other. Yeah. Might be able to, once we get past them, get a peek back in into the barrels. Looks like there's portholes inboard of this one. Oh yeah. It'd be bad to have a cabin there. Quite loud. I like the uh, the portholes that are underneath where the smokestack comes out. So you're, if, if they're venting, you're going to have a nice uh, view of black smoke out your window. From what I read, that was all uh, some of the engineering going on and, and trying to figure out how to exhaust stack gases. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I mean, um, you know, almost every other ship that I'm aware of has the vents coming up straight up. Uh, it's an interesting design. And I, I hope that, I mean, we'll, it's probably, I'm actually certain there's no chance of it, but it would have been nice to see if it had been still on this wreck because it was not on Akagi, but given the mm -hmm. level of destruction, my guess is that it's long gone. So there's not, don't appear to be portholes around this gun screen center right now, but there right. are around the one to our right. That helps you to know where we're, on the vessel, and it appears to me that the two portholes closest to the turret are higher in ship's elevation than the ones further away. Yeah, so we are um, at the one in front is the second, so we're, we're missing one gun, then there's that one, and then the third gun had portholes above it. Okay. That does help, thanks. Yeah, we're, we're pretty good on position now. We've seen enough clues, enough evidence where port side in the area um, well, close to the aft elevator. Go ahead, shore side. And these are main deck original design then? Battleship hull yeah. converted to aircraft carrier. Did that conversion happen during World War II? To I believe it was in the 1920s. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Japan's military was limited in the amount of certain types of vessels they could mm -hmm. build by the treaty after World War I. And I, I think there was a general feeling that the limitations were unfair. It's often called the 553 treaty. another circle right there. The, the British and other Western it. powers got a ratio yeah. of five and five, and Japan got a ratio of three. And so they weren't allowed to lay down um, carrier hulls. And 
they had to convert them quickly uh, when the decision was made to do that. There's another one of these circles of uh, apparent equal diameter uh, further aft, but it appears to be standing taller than these, uh, almost a deck's worth maybe, off to our starboard. Right there, you can see the very top of it. It's almost white reflective at the top. Yep. Can we tilt tilt down, Tito, and get a look at that tub or circular? Yeah, yeah, that feature there. Study that a bit more. From the diagrams I have, the top of the casemates guns are have rounded domes, and I'm not seeing a rounded dome on that. Well, it th looks th that like would be the support for it, right? What we're looking at that's standing up. This is the bottom of it they're conjecturing? Well, I'm, I'm just not sure what that is. If it's a gun tub upside down that's fallen from above or top of the first casemate gun. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's a casemate. Go ahead, Shoreside. Yeah, I, I, I like where you're thinking. It's uh, the aftermost uh, upside down 12 seven. You know, Joe Hoyt uh, also mentioned that those cylinder holes in the interior shot potentially could be old gun mount from or deck mounted, you know, eight inch or larger, I'm not sure the armament and it was um, before it was converted, but those could have been, you know, Can deck weapon you mount. Tilt down just um, a little more Tito. Sorry. Here we go. Right, thank you, Phil. And unfortunately uh, the comms are getting broken up a little bit. I hope it's a temporary aberration. Almost like there's a circle there that matches the ones we're seeing inboard. Yeah, but I was wondering the same. Yeah. Thank you, Tito. Could it be an old gun turret? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as we go back to our looking up uh, to our starboard, uh, there appears to be this one circle we're seeing on the far left one approximately screen center and then off to right there looks like there's another one but rising higher we'll see when we get there But it raises interesting questions, you know, if we're looking at things that potentially were higher up and fell over, that means they did it in place, that they were up there on the upper levels of the gun platforms mm -hmm. as the, the vessel hit the bottom and then fell over. But the destruction came, the tremendous destruction that the upper decks came from, the fires, explosions, and igniting the interior gas and air mixtures in the hangar which blew things out, which says there wasn't anything left when uh, the ship hit the bottom. Full white. So, interesting questions. Do we Tom, can you uh, hear any better here at the ECC? Uh, broken up, Shoreside. I'm able to make you out shore, but there's a little intermittent gaps in your audio. Do we know if this wreck drifted far from where it was appeared to sink? It did drift after the attack. And I believe it was under power still. Although the decision made to send the torpedoes into the hull and scuttle the ship was, I think, later that evening rather than in, in uh, Akagi's fate the next day, early morning. But yes, it's, it's not in the location where the uh, attack happened. And there's that uh, item I was referring to. I don't know what that white is. 
I'm so impressed, and I, and I think for all of our viewers, it's so important to understand, you know, that although we're sitting here with these views of this site, you know, there's still oh, so amid gone. the destruction and with so much confusion still, yeah. you know, unclear still what exactly we're looking at. Um, I think that's poignant that this isn't just, you know, look and see. This really is an active investigation. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right. That is the casemate gun. That's a great shot. Coming out a little bit. 20 centimeter casemate. Yep, one of 10 20 centimeter casemate guns carried very low down towards the water line remnant of the design of the original battleship hull. They're going to have to wait till we get further down to get a good shot there. Huh? Um, and, and, and look, it killed it. I mean... Could one of our archaeology team talk us through a casemate gun? What makes it different than others? One, two, three, four, five, right there. Uh, studio. Uh, let me uh, turn you up, Megan. I'm not sure we heard that. Uh, Thanks, Ed. Which studio are you on? I'm on Studio One. Studio One, I stand by. I can also speak up as there though it is go. not five I got in the you. morning. Thank I just you. gave you a nice boost. Phil or anyone on the archaeology team, could you explain for us a casemate gun and what makes it different from the others? Well, sure. And, and jump in here, my cons, others. Uh, casemates are certainly heavier guns that were lower in the water line. And are remnants from older naval strategies that were used in ship-to-ship -ship, uh, fighting and combat designed to pierce, um, you know, holes of other vessels. So um, they were encased, they were protected, they were armored, and they represent often some of the largest armaments um, of, of battleships, and in this case, aircraft looks carriers. looks like another intact gun just uh, aft. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Phil. It's, it's clear that, you know, this is designed to be a ship-to-ship -ship weapon rather than the kind of anti-aircraft weapons we were looking at higher up for aircraft carriers, which could often be elevated to 90 degrees. But, you know, from its Im embedded and armored shape as part of the hull itself, it, I think that's part of being a casemate gun. On yeah, and, and what makes it casemate is um, is that it's a uh, hull. It's mounted on the hull rather than on the deck, like it would be for a battleship or destroyer. I wonder, is that another mount for a casemate, and we're missing one? I think it is. I think one of them's uh. Yeah, this, uh, this does yeah, this have... Yeah, two. Looks to me like roller bearings. Yeah. Yeah, right. that's where they, one of the casemate guns was there. Is yeah. that what we're seeing upside down there? No. No, it's, no, it's just right that's shape. the mount where the turret was. Yeah. Uh, so how many along each side were I? Coming? I think there were five. Five on this so one. So we can see four from here uh, if you look just yeah there uh, should be three just, just to the right here there's another uh, barrel sticking out yeah there should be three more to the right we're all after this one yep there's one but they're not perfectly in a even row there's oh i guess they are actually never mind disregard i can't really make out if there's another one down there or not it's possible Do they have a domed top on these uh yeah. semicircles yeah or yeah, they were domed. 
Thank you. So we get a push on this one. Head left or right? Uh, I was looking at the top of the uh, that area right there. So I believe we're done our movement aft. Would we like to do another step? Keep us yeah. moving along. Uh, yeah, yeah, sounds good. There we go. We'll do we're, a, we're at a great spot off the right off offside the wreck. Pilot, would you like to keep that same heading? We were at one one five for that last move. Yes. So I'm looking at these uh, casemate guns, and I'm just like trying to imagine what they like sounded like when they were being used, um, like how they were used. Would this be something where like one person would stand back there and fire them? Do we know that? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but you, someone would be inside. Um, we don't actually know. I mean, other versions were, of course, but we don't know if uh, either Kaga or Akagi ever actually fired them outside of practice because mm -hmm. they were never, they're aircraft carriers, they weren't doing ship to ship yeah. firing. I think they just kept them here because they're already installed when they yeah. were a, a cruiser in a battleship uh, hull. I don't think they were really ever, Right. I don't know, they may not have even carried ammunition for them. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they weren't ever intending to be, and they were never attacking ship to ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my guess would be they, they weren't used in the Battle of Midway at all. The vessels never saw each other. Yeah. Might be able to, once we get past them, get a peek back in into the barrels. Looks like there's portholes inboard of this one. Oh yeah. It'd be bad to have a cabin there quite loud. I like the uh, the portholes that are underneath where the smokestack comes out, so you're, if, if they're venting, you're going to have a nice uh, view of black smoke out your window. From what I read, that was all uh, some of the engineering going on and, and trying to figure out how to exhaust stack gases. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I mean, um, you know, almost every other ship that I'm aware of has the vents coming up s straight up. Uh, it's an interesting design, and I, I hope that. I mean, we'll see. it's probably. I'm actually certain there's no chance of it, but it would have been nice to see if it had been still on this wreck because it was not on Akagi. But given the mm -hmm. level of destruction, my guess is that it's long gone. So there's not. Don't appear to be portholes around this gun screen center right now, but right. there are around the one to our right. If that helps you to know where we're on the vessel, and it appears to me that the two portholes closest to the turret are higher in ship's elevation than the ones further away. Yeah, so we are um, at the one in front is the second. So we're, we're missing one gun, then there's that one, and then the third gun had portholes above it. Okay. That does help, thanks. Yeah, we're, we're pretty good on position now. We've seen enough clues, enough evidence where Port side in the area, um, well, close to the aft elevator. Go ahead, shore side. And these are main deck original design then? Sorry, what was that video? Is this a main deck? Uh, uh, we saw two faces to the left of these two guns. So this may be number four. Uh, did you hear that, Science? The shore was saying they thought they saw two bases to the left of these, so this may be okay. number four. But that first circle that we saw did not have the gearing at the base that the second one did. Yeah, it could have been damaged, though, because I don't see another one further forward, so they may be right on that.
Our colleagues on the science chat note that the dome part of these casemate guns is part of the non-rotating structure above the gun. So it's just that the face of the, uh, the cylinder there with, with the barrel that rotates. Mm. Thank you, John. And there's um, there's going to be five more of these, or a, a maximum of five more of these uh, to see on the other side. So for viewers who missed our dive on the USS Yorktown and our dive on Akagi, uh, when and where will they be able to access videos, footage? They will, we will be releasing highlights mm -hmm. um, of all of the dives on Nautilus Live and on YouTube. So, so. stay tuned. Obviously the story is still unfolding as yeah. we're still diving on. Um, that left, right? Up that left. It looks like the uh, bottom of this turret might be eroded away. I might be seeing inside it. Do you yeah. see that? Yeah, I'll come out wide. Yeah, as we're still diving. So absolutely stay tuned for our social media channels and uh, Nautilus Live. Yeah, and this is a 24 hour yeah, dive, okay. yes? Uh -huh. 20. 20. Yes. So lots, lots more time. Yeah. On the seabed. Yeah, that might be just a pattern in the, the, the fouling or corrosion pattern on the face of the, the turret, I'm not sure. Well, the shadows inside are making me think um, it's hard with this. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, that there's depth. There. I'd be surprised if something was, you know, if that wasn't quite thick material. Interesting. There's the shadows that I think I don't think that I don't think that shadows. I think that's the bacterial mats that you were looking yeah. at uh, in the sediment. It's up. just the face. Yeah, that's not shadow. Sure, yeah. protruding out. It's be after this move is complete, though it looks like. Yep. Solid twenty meters out. Yeah. Thank you. Derek, how did you spot that hazard? Were you looking at the sonar or were you just looking at like the video? Oh, we were looking at the sonar image, yeah. Looks like something's going to protrude out from the ship about 20 meters aft of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. so we might have to, um, well, we're definitely going to have to probably pull, pull up and go over or pull away from the ship a little bit. I wonder if we can see down that first barrel we saw now. Uh, I haven't moved for them far enough along yet. And what's the scale on the sonar now? I know that we said it's not uh, always staying the exact same. So during the dive, I'm going to try to keep it at 10 meters. At 10 meters. And I may pop in and out just to get a sense mm -hmm. of the, where we are on the wreck and such. But mm -hmm. uh, typically, it's going to be at 10. Cool. Thank you, Tito. You're welcome. Head up, down, sideways. Uh, you're doing fine there. Uh, barrel or that. Uh, that? I just got a quick glimpse of that barrel. It didn't look rifled. What's up above that? Uh, that little thing on the top. I tried to image that earlier, but it's a rack of some sort. I can't write. Where is it? Deck protrusions, maybe? Oh, sorry. Runaway zoom. I remember when I would um, build plastic models of ships as a kid with my dad, we would, uh, there were some plastic gun parts that looked like these and we'd have to fit them inside the hull. I don't remember which ships we were building at the time though, but it's, it looks like some of the parts that I remember putting on. I think that thousand pound bomb knocked a lot of focus off of this vessel as well. Super hard to focus on. 
Okay. <laughs> I was like, what's he talking about? <laughs> Mike, do you think that like building ships like that when you were young is something that got you interested in this field specifically? No, it was the opposite. Um, after I saw the National Geographic video of uh, Ballard's discovery of the Bismarck at Woods Hole on a field trip, mm -hmm. um, I then went and tried to make, build all the models of, from that battle. So, mm. yeah, yeah, my interest in, my sudden consuming interest in shipwrecks had me start building the models of the ships. Mm. I never painted them though, because I wasn't any good at that. So they Oops. were just the, I thought that the plat, the gray plastic of the models looked ship-like enough. Does that look like, like another enough. turret? Maybe the gun, the barrel's in board? Oh, that could be, yeah. That oh, could yeah. be the fifth one. Just without a barrel. Yep. Or it could swing inboard. I, mean, I will know when we get there. I don't there. think, yeah, maybe. No, I don't think they could. It could swing yeah, to the you? side, but not all the way inboard. Yeah. It's like when, um, oh, when... There we go, can't get that barrel. When Leia Roll turns... Left and down. Go ahead. Leia turns... It turns the gun on the, uh, the Jabba's barge and blows. Oh, yeah. It's like, why would you design a gun that can hit your own ship? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. But that is an interesting shape because I don't see it, at least in this diagram, this drawing. Another casemate shape. Yeah, it could be that the... Aft of number five. The, the barrel could have broken off. I'm full wide. Are we doing on tension? Can we go left a little? I just Actually, it might be we're not seeing it and it's aligned further yeah, aft, if it's, if it's maybe. Pointed, if it's pointed direct aft. You know, I'm Mike, I remember what we used to do with those plastic models, too, and the yeah. reenactments and destruction oh, yeah. that was wrought on those poor Ravel models. Yeah, like yeah. the protrusion we were seeing, or parts of it. Everybody, uh, I, I, I think if, if, if that's indeed the fifth case made, it's also worth noting, we, we certainly wouldn't expect to see uh, propellers given bloodline, but uh, the, the innermost propeller would be with first at 20 centimeter case. This would be one of those where one of the four propellers would be okay. just there. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, I caught most of that. It um, reminds me of speaking on dive wireless dive comms underwater. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit broken up, but Minus. yeah, I'm still wondering if this is the fifth case made as well because the barrel's not there unless it's pointed further aft. And as you know, those are fairly securely uh, mounted. I'll do a push when we swing back aft, and we'll get a view here. View the barrel. These 20 millimeters don't look like sorry, runaway zoom. Don't look like they were uh, rifled. Hmm. It is the Run right away. shape to be the fifth casemate. Sorry, I'm in a comms issue here. Okay, there we go. Nope, no, I'm zooming out. Yeah, I'm just wondering where the barrel is. Full wide. Yeah. Because if, if it's, it falls out, there's no hole for the... Right, it could be turned all the way aft. And beneath those rusticles. Yeah, if we're at the... Uh, same areas of propeller were probably in the original design aft of the house, so it could be something that might be able to aim aft. Oh, it looks like there's a porthole too, and it doesn't line up. It sure looks the same as that one with the barrel. Let's see something here real quick. Can I focus on that? Up, down, sideways, up? Uh, right there. Uh, I'm pulling out. Oh, well. Jake, is this uh, zoom control a serial thing? Ethernet? On Mini, mini Zeus? Yeah. yeah. I believe it's serial. Okay. Great, you guys. Now I want breakfast. You just said cereal. Uh, <laughs> could be a loose connection in the J box, maybe. Oh, let's see if I can get. Okay. 
Sorry for the zooming in and out. That's the only way I can halt the zoom. Yeah, there are the, the portholes aft. Yeah, I don't know where the barrel is, if that's a casemate gun. But uh, just because, you know, our drawn diagrams and older historic photos show all the barrels in the casemates, doesn't say well, the barrel was in number five casemate when they yeah, went there, to Midway. There could be a small hole, maybe even right there. Oh yeah, yeah. That maybe held looking, the barrels. looking right at us. That's how it has been encrusted. Um, there's a little oval where there's not encrusting. And it's about the same angle. Do you, do you see that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. There. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just missing. Oh no, it's this hole here. I think it's just missing its uh, its barrel. And that may, you're right. That may not have that may not have even had it at Midway. It may have just been for some reason they had to remove it. Bridge nav. I'd like to do a ship move two zero meters, bearing one one seven. Yeah, I might keep an eye on this hazard to our right. Top of there? Sure, you have stuff coming Correct. up on Thank there. Still, still one fifteen one meters one. off. <clears throat> there. Wasn't there one above the other as well? Somebody could go back and look at that. Uh, I meant in the footage, not in uh, space. In I time. the other one had like that uh, tray above it. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Sebastian, does this look like the um, same anemones we've been seeing consistently? Maybe there's an elevator that fed ammunition into these for each one from the magazine up to here. I'm going to rotate forward. We've got yeah. uh, a little yeah, protrusion coming in. I, I think we're going to clear it, but not by a lot. <laughs> um, to answer your question, yes, I do believe these are all the same species of anemones across the three wrecks. I'm seeing pretty much the exact same species at all the wrecks, which is not surprising because in terms of like abyssal plains and where these sh ships rise, the biota is relatively largely the same across great areas of ocean. It could just be sediment that we saw in the sonar, that mound there. Given the much lower elevation of the shipwreck, yeah, that's a real possibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say that we probably don't need to do any um, second pass of just the mudline. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, save some time. Um, there's a gap in that piece right there. Do you see it? We're looking right through it right now. Yeah, that's more of those holes to in the metal to save uh, save on weight. I'm wondering if this lower hole is built of a different material than the previous wrecks, because the anemones seem to prefer to settle on them now, opposed to the other two, which they only settle like in the high up places or in the same places. But this one, they seem to be occupying that inner hole wherever too yeah but these these would have been the same materials so on the far left of this piece is that abandoned the metal uh, can we uh turn uh, yeah i think it's just a, pl a, a hull plate that's come loose sorry what was that video? is this a main deck uh, uh we saw two bases to the left of these two guns, so this may be number four. Uh, did you hear that, Science? The shore was saying they thought they saw two bases to the left of these, so this may be oh, okay. number four. But that first circle that we saw did not have the gearing at the base that the second one did. Yeah, it could have been damaged, though, because I don't see another one further forward, so they may be right on that.
Our colleagues on the science chat note that the dome part of these casemate guns is part of the non-rotating structure above the gun. So it's just that the face of the, uh, the cylinder there with, with the barrel that rotates. Mm. Thank you, John. And there's um, there's going to be five more of these, or a, a maximum of five more of these uh, to see on the other side. So for viewers who missed our dive on the USS Yorktown and our dive on Akagi, uh, when and where will they be able to access videos, footage? They will, we will be releasing highlights mm -hmm. um, of all of the dives on Nautilus Live and on YouTube. So, so. stay tuned. Obviously the story is still unfolding as yeah. we're still diving on. Uh, that left, right? Up uh, left. It looks like the uh, bottom of this turret might be eroded away. I might be seeing inside it. Do you yeah. see that? Yeah, come out wide. Yeah, as we're still diving. So absolutely stay tuned for our social media channels and uh, Nautilus Live. Yeah, and this is a 24 hour yeah, dive, yeah. yes? Uh -huh. 20. 20. Yes. So lots, lots more time. Yeah. On the seabed. Yeah, that might be just a pattern in the, the, the fouling or corrosion pattern on the face of the, the turret, I'm not sure. Well, the shadows inside are making me think um, it's hard with this. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, that there's depth. There. I'd be surprised if something was, you know, if that wasn't quite thick material. Interesting. Because the shadows that I think I don't think that I don't think that shadows. I think that's the bacterial mats that you were looking yeah. at uh, in the sediment. It's out. just the face. Yeah, that's not shadow. Sure, yeah. protruding out. To be after this move is complete, though it looks like. Yep. Solid twenty meters out. Yeah. Thank you. Derek, how did you spot that hazard? Were you looking at the sonar or were you just looking at like the video? Oh, we were looking at the sonar image, yeah. Looks like something's going to protrude out from the ship about 20 meters aft of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. so we might have to, um, well, we're definitely going to have to probably pull, pull up and go over or pull away from the ship a little bit. I wonder if we can see down that first barrel we saw now. Uh, I haven't moved forward them far enough along yet. And what's the scale on the sonar now? I know that we said it's not uh, always staying the exact same. So during the dive, I'm going to try to keep it at 10 meters. At 10 meters. And I may pop in and out just to get a sense mm -hmm. of the, where we are on the wreck and such. But mm -hmm. uh, typically, it's going to be at 10. Cool. Thank you, Tito. You're welcome. Head up, down, sideways. Uh, you're doing fine there. Uh, barrel or that. Uh, that? I just got a quick glimpse of that barrel. It didn't look rifled. What's up above that? Uh, that little thing on the top. I tried to image that earlier, but it's a rack of some sort. I can't write. Where is it? Deck protrusions, maybe? Oh, sorry. Runaway zoom. I remember when I would um, build plastic models of ships as a kid with my dad, we would, uh, there were some plastic gun parts that looked like these and we'd have to fit them inside the hull. I don't remember which ships we were building at the time though, but it's, it looks like some of the parts that I remember putting on. I think that thousand pound bomb knocked a lot of focus off of this vessel as well. Super hard to focus on. 
okay. <laughs> I was like, what's he talking about? <laughs> Mike, do you think that like building ships like that when you were young is something that got you interested in this field specifically? No, it was the opposite. Um, after I saw the National Geographic video of uh, Ballard's discovery of the Bismarck at Woods Hole on a field trip, Mm -hmm. um, I then went and tried to make, build all the models of, from that battle. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my interest in, my sudden consuming interest in shipwrecks had me start building the models of the ships. Mm -hmm. I never painted them though, because I wasn't any good at that. So they Oops. were just the, I thought that the pla the gray plastic of the models looked ship-like look like like enough. turret, maybe the gun, the barrels in board. Oh, that could be, yeah. That oh, could yeah. be the fifth one. Just without a barrel. Yeah. Or it could swing inboard. I, mean, I will know when we get I don't there. Think, yeah, maybe. I don't think they could. It could swing yeah, to the you? side, but not all the way inboard. Mm. It's like when... Um, oh, when there we go. Can I get that barrel? When Leia Roll turns... Roll and down. <laughs> go ahead. Leia turns... It turns the gun on the, uh, the Jabba's barge and blows. Oh, yeah. It's like, why would you design a gun that can hit your own ship? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. But that is an interesting shape because I don't see it, at least in this diagram, this drawing, another casemate shape. Yeah, it could be that the... After the number five. The, the barrel could have broken off. I'm full wide. How are we doing on tension? Can we go left a little? I just Actually, it might be we're not seeing it, and it's aligned further yeah, aft, if it's, if it's maybe. Pointed, if it's pointed direct aft. You know, Mike, I remember what we used to do with those plastic models, too, and the reenactments yeah. and destruction oh, yeah. that was wrought on those poor Ravel models. Looks yeah, like yeah. the protrusion we were seeing, or parts of it. Everybody, I, I, I think if, if, if that's indeed the fifth case made, it's also worth noting, we, we certainly wouldn't expect to see uh, propellers given bloodline, but uh, the, the innermost propeller would be with first at 20 centimeter case. This would be one of those where one of the four propellers would be okay. just buried. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, I caught most of that. It um, reminds me of speaking on dive, wireless dive comms underwater. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit broken up, but Minus. yeah, I'm still wondering if this is the fifth case made as well because the barrel's not there unless it's pointed further aft. And as you know, those are fairly securely uh, mounted. I'll do a push when we swing back aft and we'll get a better view here. View the barrel, these 20 millimeters don't look like, sorry, runaway zoom, don't look like they were uh, rifled. Hmm. It is the Run right away. shape to be the fifth casemate. Sorry, I'm in a comms issue here. Okay, there we go. Nope, no, I'm zooming out. Yeah, I'm just wondering where the barrel is. Full wide. Yeah. Because if, if it's, it falls out, there's no hole for the... Right, it could be turned all the way aft. Yeah. And beneath those rusticles. Yeah, if we're at the... Uh, same areas of propeller were probably in the original design aft of the house, so it could be something that might be able to aim aft. Oh, it looks like there's a porthole too, and it doesn't line up. It sure looks the same as that one with the barrel. Let's see something here real quick. Can I focus on that? Up, down, sideways, up? Uh, right there. Uh, I'm pulling out. Oh, well. Jake, is this uh, zoom control a serial thing? Ethernet? On Mini, mini Zeus? Yeah. yeah. I believe it's serial. Okay. Great, you guys. Now I want breakfast. You just said cereal. Uh, <laughs> could be a loose connection in the J box, maybe. Oh, let's see if I can. Okay. 
Sorry for the zooming in and out. That's the only way I can halt the zoom. Yeah, there are the, the portholes aft. Yeah, I don't know where the barrel is, if that's a casemate gun. But uh, just because, you know, our drawn diagrams and older historic photos show all the barrels in the casemates, doesn't say well, the barrel was in number five casemate when they went there, to Midway. There could be a small hole, maybe even right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. That maybe held looking, the barrel. Looking right at us. That's, that's been encrusted. Um, there's a little oval where there's not encrusting. And it's about the same angle. Do you, do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just miss. Oh, no, it's this hole here. I think it's just missing its uh, its barrel. And that may, you're right. That may not have that may not have even had it at Midway. It may have just been, for some reason, they had to remove it. Bridge nav. If they could do a ship move two zero meters, bearing one one seven. Yeah, I might keep an eye on this Push hazard on to our right. Top of there. Sure, you've stuff coming Correct. up on uh, there. Still, still fifteen one meters one. off. <coughs> there. Wasn't there one above the other as well? Somebody could go back and look at that. Uh, I meant in the footage, not in uh, space. In I time. the other one had like that uh, tray above it. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Sebastian, does this look like the um, same anemones we've been seeing consistently? Maybe there's an elevator that fed ammunition into these for each one from the magazine up to here. I'm going to rotate forward. We've got yeah. uh, a little yeah, intrusion coming, see what's and coming I, at I think us. we're going to clear it, but not by a lot. <laughs> um, to answer your question, yes, I do believe these are all the same species of anemones across the three racks. I'm seeing pretty much the exact same species at all the wrecks, which is not surprising because in terms of like abyssal plains and where these sh ships rise, the biota is relatively largely the same across the great areas of ocean. It could just be sediment that we saw in the sonar, that mound there. Given the much lower elevation of the shipwreck, yeah, that's a real possibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say that we probably don't need to do any um, second pass of just the mudline. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, save some time. Um, there's a gap in that piece right there. Do you see it? We're looking right through it right now. Yeah, that's more of those holes to in the metal to save uh, save on weight. I'm wondering if this lower hole is built of a different material than the previous wrecks, because the anemones seem to prefer to settle on them now, opposed to the other two, which they only settle like in the high up places or in the same places. But this one, they seem to be occupying that inner hole wherever too. Yeah, but these, these would have been the same materials. So on the far left of this piece, is that a bend in the metal? Uh, can we uh, turn? Uh, yeah. I think it's just a, pl a, a hull plate that's come loose. At left, right? Uh, right there, yeah. I At left, right? Uh, right there, yeah. I can't really tell from here. I'm sorry. Oh, You're, we're good. Roger. We're good. It's pretty dramatic the way the rusticles, you know, kind of graphically demonstrate the, the corrosion of the steel and, you know, how the steel is essentially just melting yeah. and pouring into the, onto the ocean floor. This does seem like a large chunk of ship that just broke off, because this would have been interior, would it not? Yeah, through that plate it would have been, yeah. 
This is the this is the stern at this point. I mean, we're we're pretty close to it. Um, so there wouldn't have actually been a, a lot of superstructure. There would have been uh, supports holding up the flight deck, but we're actually I think just at the spot where the hangar deck would have ended. Right, getting close to that, probably right over there on the right. That that piece that sticks up is probably one of the supports. Like there's some metal on the seafloor down there, and maybe rusticles reaching all the way down to the sediment. The three of them. Yep. Looks like our next move, we're going to have to angle. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, looking at the sonar and Coming judging out. from where we are, we expect the aircraft carrier to flatten out and just become that. Battleship stern. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, I'll probably wait till this settles out a little bit. Um, or, you know what? Maybe back to 115. Well, we'll get, we are getting a little far out, yeah. so I think 110 will be fine. Okay. Let's just wait a couple of minutes. Um, I want to see how this translates. Hmm? Not yet. It's on at 7.30. <laughs> yeah. I know because I'm on this watch. That was really interesting looking at those casemate guns and this is quite interesting too where we're back towards the, the aft part of the hangars and looking at, you know, even here they've been blown out by those massive explosions that occurred. On the wreck of the Akagi, the Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi, of course, the flight deck was incredibly damaged, but we still had, you know, hangar superstructure all the way to the end where the, just the aft portion had been opened up. But here, almost none of the hangar superstructure still exists. We even had parts of Akagi that where the flight deck was still existed like it was torn off and it was flipped over but it still we could still see pieces of it. i don't think the flight deck right there's nothing of it still even present nothing so far on the kaga hey N nautilus uh ecc can you hear us okay yeah yep. that sounds clear. great now thank you i'm clear well i you know I, I moved the fan that was pointing right at the microphone so maybe that helps oh uh, yeah that's um, uh, yeah good idea yeah wow Good work, Bill. Um, the, uh, the aft deck where the, the small boats would be housed, I mean, that was all fairly open. Jeff is, is mentioning this. And the hangar deck, I think, ends a little bit further forward than where we are. Could potentially this be some of those lower decks that are just blown out and folded over and, and maybe the hangar deck? Yeah, I, I agree. In fact, I'm looking at that, that pillar or post right there, wondering if that's the first support for the elevated flight deck high above. Oh, what the heck? Did you turn on the light? Nope, that was Iris, I think. It must have been interesting to be the, uh, the Japanese uh, shipbuilders who were like suddenly, oh no, you're now building an aircraft carrier. Well, put a flight yeah. deck on that. Um, okay. And it's just remarkable to me that it was, you know, 
less than 40 years earlier, man flew for the first time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Still amazing, it was 66 years from first flight to being on the moon. Yep. Yeah, Phil and, and Shore Team, I, you know, I don't know that that's a support post. I don't see it extending down to the, the deck of the battleship. Yeah, interesting, huh? Do I see the top of it? Is it a vent? No. Looks solid. Oh, maybe not. Huh. I think I might be seeing inside it. Can we tilt up a little? Or is there... Tilting up? Yeah, right there. Then a little more? Yeah, well, all depends on the heave. I go. Oh, sorry, runaway zoom. That go. left, right? Uh, that's what I'm looking for right there. I mean, just that looks like somebody could get in there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it almost looks like a stove. It's not. It has that it, shape. Just, yeah. yeah, like you yeah, got the Coming open out. pit in there. And so is this the end of the vessel, or is it continuing? In the sonar, there's a little bit more forward and to the right, but I don't. It may not be preserved out here where we are. Yeah, I think I see a small rise from the sediment, but we'll know when we get there. We've still got to make our way to the fantail. We're at the near the end of the hangar deck. Yeah, we're um, we're wondering if the fantail's there. Oh, yeah. I see. Because I think it is. I'm I think you can see it. Yeah, just very, very low relief. Yeah. Well, it would be much. Yeah, I don't know. It does drop down right around here or further back. Tito, I'm still thinking about that perspective you shared just like a few moments ago. You said 66 years in between first flight and landing on the moon. That's just like wild for me to sit here and wrap my mind around that just was the a, adaptation. That was Ed. That is a profound oh, that was Ed? statement, I would yeah. uh, Neil Armstrong took with him to the moon a canvas piece of the wing of uh, the Wright Brothers plane. And, oh, really? Uh, a piece, piece of wood from their propeller both of which are in the Smithsonian with uh, certificates for authenticity from the Wright Brothers group and from mm. NASA. Huh, I did not know that. That's very yeah, cool. As a matter of fact, I have an image of that on my phone. Hmm. My students are doing a space exploration project right now, and if any of you are listening and that was what you chose as your topic, that'd be interesting for you to include. <laughs> no cheating off head. And your, te <laughs> and your teacher now expects you to include it <laughs> to test to see if they're watching. <laughs> I thought that their sister also played a role in that innovation and invention too. Yeah, so they're, they're right uh, brothers so whenever I hear book. the whenever yeah. I hear the Wright brothers, I think, well, you know, there's someone else there as well they're, that they're didn't get mentioned. The Wright siblings. Something interesting poking itself. Uh, very the distinct, circle. That round shape. Yeah. Wow, Ed, this is incredible. Yeah. I did not know that. One lifetime. Mm. There's a good book on the Wright brothers. Is it Walter Isaacson who wrote that? I'm also just kind of reflecting on what um, these service members like kind of witnessed within their lifetime. We were just sitting here talking about how young so many of them were, and like I just can't imagine just. I don't know, yeah. all the things they saw and witnessed and... You're right. Bridge, Nav. Oh. Ship move, please. Two zero meters, bearing one one zero. Thank you. No, I'm not sure what you think, but it, it looks it looks to be we're at that forward end of the small boat hangar. Um, 
Yeah. With the curvature of the hull, I, what, what do you suppose that uh, that pulpit is? I mean, could that be kind of a director's position, or or is that just a support piece? I think that's a support piece right behind the uh, the the that area. Yeah. It's exactly where Hans is moving his ma mouse cursor, but you can't see that. <laughs> Yeah, I see it is it is attached and runs all the way down and, and that's the position for that that large post that extended all the way up to the flight deck high above. And then there'll be, you know, of course the two more pylons or pillars on the port side here as we move towards the uh fantail. And they look to be similar size, at least in the drawings. I mean, those are big pieces. It's they are big. And the interesting thing is, Phil, that, you know, for something that, you know, is obviously broken, it sure is clean. There sure is a flat. That is you, circled you in all we have, dead ahead. That's all we have of the stern. Oh. See that circle? Huh? Uh, control four. Say it There's isn't a circle so. circle right there. Yeah, something there. That would really be surprising. You know, both at the bow and stern, when the hull comes together and narrows, and you know the framing patterns, you know, support all that, and and you have you know solid transoms. I mean, that's pretty strong structure. Yeah. And if that is, if the fantail and the aft deck is missing, I, it's a really surprising. Well, so this sunk by the. Stern, I think. stern. Yeah. And so I want. It's possible that the uh, the two torpedoes from the from Hagikaze struck back here. Yeah, maybe. These visuals unfold so slowly over time, but just looking to the right, you're not seeing. I, I see the same, but that line just does not continue. Yeah. About how much are you estimating the ship length would have continued? Probably another mm, five to ten meters. Like it's not a large portion, it's really just the last part of it aft, but it's just, yeah, not there. Yep. The boat deck, the fair leads from mooring lines, etc. Now if it, if the wreck, or if the ship did strike the seabed stern first, it could have fall, snapped off and fallen forward, and then the rest of it's buried in mud. Yeah, this vessel is really deeply buried. Yeah. But both visually and on sonar, we're running out of hull here. That yeah. Looks like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Megan, are you on mm -hmm. train or belt? I'm on train. Thank you. I'm moving around to keep you on your toes. Yeah, I heard your voice. I looked back at the studio and like, well, she's not there. Where is she? <laughs> yeah, I had the same experience. I see you now. She could be anywhere. <laughs> um, this sediment, it looks pretty similar to what we've been seeing at Akagi in Yorktown. Is that, y'all agree with that? Yeah. I feel like I can't really tell much about it. I mean, it, yeah, it's hard to tell, but um, just looking at sediment, but it, it does have that same um, muddy look. Uh, and, and we can see where um, the, the wreck land. From here. I'm sorry. You're, we're good. Roger. We're good. It's pretty dramatic the way the rusticles, you know, kind of graphically demonstrate the, the corrosion of the steel and, you know, how the steel is essentially just melting yeah. and pouring into the, onto the ocean floor. This does seem like a large chunk of ship that just broke off, because this would have been interior, would it not? Yeah, through that plate it would have been, yeah. This is the this is the stern at this point. I mean we're we're pretty close to it. Um, 
So there wouldn't have actually been a, a lot of superstructure. There would have been uh, supports holding up the flight deck, but we we're actually, I think, just at the spot where the hangar deck would have ended. Right, getting close to that, probably right over there on the right. That, that piece that sticks up is probably one of the supports. Like there's some metal on the seafloor down there, and maybe rusticles reaching all the way down to the sediment. The three of them. Yep. Looks like our next move, we're going to have to angle. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, looking at the sonar and Coming judging up. from where we are, we expect the aircraft carrier to flatten out and just become that. Battleship Stern. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, I'll probably wait till this settles out a little bit. Um, or, you know what? Maybe back to 115. Well, we'll get, we are getting a little far out, so I think 110 will be fine. Okay. Let's just wait a couple of minutes. Um, I want to see how this translates. Hmm? Not yet. It's on at 7.30. <laughs> yeah. I know because I'm on this watch. That was really interesting looking at those casemate guns. And this is quite interesting too, where we're back towards the, the aft part of the hangars and looking at, you know, even here, they've been blown out by those massive explosions that occurred. On the wreck of the Akagi, the Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi, of course, the flight deck was incredibly damaged, but we still had, you know, hangar superstructure all the way to the end where the, just the aft portion had been opened up. But here, almost none of the hangar superstructure still exists. We even had parts of Akagi that where the flight deck was still existed, like it was torn off and it was flipped over, but it still, we could still see pieces of it. I don't think the flight deck, Right. there's nothing of it still even present. Nothing so far on the Kaga. Hey, N Nautilus, uh, ECC, can you hear us okay? Yeah, yep. that sounds clear. great now. Thank you. I'm clear. Well, I, you know, I, I moved the fan that was pointing right at the microphone, so maybe that helps. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, um, uh, yeah, good idea. Yeah, wow. Good work, Bill. Um, the uh, the aft deck where the the small boats would be housed. I mean, that was all fairly open. Jeff is, is mentioning this, and the hangar deck I think ends a little bit further forward than where we are. Could potentially this be some of those lower decks that are just blown out and folded over, and, and maybe the hangar deck? Yeah, I, I agree. In fact, I'm looking at that what's... that pillar or post right there, wondering if that's the first support for the elevated flight deck high above. Oh, what the heck, did you turn on the light? Nope, that was Iris, I think. It must have been interesting to be the, uh, the Japanese uh, shipbuilders who were like suddenly, oh no, you're now building an aircraft carrier. Well, put a flight yeah. deck on that. Um, okay. And it's just remarkable to me that it was, you know, less than 40 years earlier, man flew for the first time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
still amazed it was 66 years from first flight to being on the moon. Yep. Yeah, Phil and, and Shore Team, I, you know, I don't know that that's a support post. I don't see it extending down to the, the deck of the battleship. Yeah, interesting, huh? Do I see the top of it? Is it a vent? No. Looks solid. Oh, maybe not. I think I might be seeing inside it. Can we tilt up a little? Or is there a Tilting up? Yeah, right there. Then a little more? Yeah, well, all depends on the heave. Like, oh, sorry, runaway zoom. That go. left, right? Uh, that's what I'm looking for right there. I mean, just that looks like somebody could get in there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it almost looks like a stove. It's not. It has that it, shape. Just, yeah. yeah, like you yeah, have the Coming open out. pit in there. And so is this the end of the vessel or is it continuing? In the sonar, there's a little bit more forward and to the right, but I don't. it may not be preserved out here where we are. Yeah, I think I see a small rise from the sediment, but we'll know when we get there. We've still got to make our way to the fantail. We're at the near the end of the hangar deck. Yeah, we're um, we're wondering if the fantail's there. Oh, yeah. I see. Because I think it is. I'm I think you can see it. Yeah, just very, very low relief. Yeah. Well, it would be much. Yeah, I don't know. It does drop down right around here or further back. Tito, I'm still thinking about that perspective you shared just like a few moments ago. You said 66 years in between first flight and landing on the moon. That's just like wild for me to sit here and wrap my mind around that just was the a, adaptation. That was Ed. That is a profound oh, that was Ed? statement, I would yeah. uh, Neil Armstrong took with him to the moon a canvas piece of the wing of uh, the Wright Brothers plane. And, oh, really? Uh, I didn't piece know that. Of, piece of wood from the propeller both of which are in the Smithsonian with uh, certificates for authenticity from the Wright Brothers group and from mm. NASA. Huh, I did not know that. That's very uh, cool. As a matter of fact, I have an image of that on my phone. Hmm. My students are doing a space exploration project right now, and if any of you are listening and that was what you chose as your topic, that'd be interesting for you to include. <laughs> no cheating off head. And your, <laughs> and your teacher now expects you to include it <laughs> to test to see if they're watching. <laughs> I thought that their sister also played a role in that innovation and invention too. Yeah, so the, the Wright uh, brothers. Whenever I hear book. the whenever yeah. I hear the Wright brothers, I think, well, you know, there's someone else there as well the, that the didn't Wrights, get mentioned. The Wright siblings. Something interesting poking itself. Uh, very the distinct, circle. That round shape. Yeah. Wow, Ed, this is incredible. Yeah. I did not know that. One lifetime. Mm. There's a good book on the Wright brothers. Is it Walter Isaacson who wrote that? I'm also just kind of reflecting on what um, these service members like kind of witnessed within their lifetime. We were just sitting here talking about how young so many of them were, and like I just can't imagine just. I don't know, yeah. all the things they saw and witnessed and... You're right. Bridge, Nav. Oh. Ship move, please. Two zero meters, bearing one one zero. Thank you. No, I'm not sure what you think, but it, uh, it looks it looks to be we're at that forward end of the small boat hangar. Um, yeah. With the curvature of the hull, I, what, what do you suppose that uh, that pulpit is? I mean, can that be kind of a director's position, or or is that just a support piece? I think that's a support piece right behind <laughs> the uh, the the 
that area, yeah. It's exactly where Hans is moving his mouse cursor, but you can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see it is it is attached and runs all the way down, and, and that's the position for that that large post that extended all the way up to the flight deck high above. And then there will be, you know, of course, the two more pylons or pillars on the port side here as we move towards the uh, fantail. And they look to be similar size, at least in the drawings. I mean, those are big pieces. It's they are big. And the interesting thing is, Phil, that, you know, for something that, you know, is obviously broken, it sure is clean. There sure is a flat. That is you, circled you in all forward, we have, dead ahead. That's all we have of the stern. Oh. Do you see that circle? Huh? Uh, control 4. Say it There's isn't a circle so. circle right there. Yeah, something there. That would really be surprising. You know, both at the bow and stern, when the hull comes together and narrows, and you know the framing patterns, you know, support all that, and and you have you know solid transoms. I mean, that's pretty strong structure. Yeah. And if that is, if the fantail and the aft deck is missing, I, it's a really surprising. Well, so this sunk by the. Stern, I think. Stern. Yeah. And so I want. It's possible that the uh, the two torpedoes from the from Hagakaze struck back here. Yeah, maybe. His visuals unfold so slowly over time, but just looking to the right, you're not seeing. I, I see the same, but that line just does not continue. Yeah. About how much are you estimating the ship length would have continued? Probably another five to ten meters. Like it's not a large portion, it's really just the last part of it aft, but it's just, yeah, not there. Yep. The boat deck, the fair leads from mooring lines, etc. Now if it, if the wreck, or if the ship did strike the seabed stern first, it could have fall, snapped off and fallen forward, and then the rest of it's buried in mud. Yeah, this vessel is really deeply buried. Yeah. But both visually and on sonar, we're running out of hull here. That yeah. Looks like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Megan, are you on mm -hmm. train or belt? I'm on train. Thank you. I'm moving around to keep you on your toes. Yeah, I heard your voice. I looked back at the studio and Michael she's not there. Where is she? <laughs> I had the same experience. I see you now. She could be anywhere. <laughs> um, this sediment, it looks pretty similar to what we've been seeing at Akagi in Yorktown. Is that, y'all agree with that? Yeah. I feel like I can't really tell much about it. I mean, it, yeah, it's hard to tell, but um, just looking at sediment, but it, it does have that same um, muddy look. Uh, and, and we can see where um, the, 